Please, dear colleagues, please have your seats. Let's see if I can get Bellman to come up here. Ask if you can get Bellman up here. The president wants to speak to him. Oh, that was a very bad. Then you can do it. I'm not sure we can pull it off with visas and all that stuff at this stage. Please, I ask colleagues to go to their seats. Please, not in the corridor anymore. And there's a gap. It's usually some ambassador is hosting the delegation for lunch. It's oh, not yeah. back yet. Yeah, yeah. You can see the little empty space. Yeah. I'm looking forward to over there for your conference in April. Yeah. See if I can get there a day early and go to the I use this old-fashioned way to ask all of the colleagues to have their own seats, not to stay anymore in the corridor. We are ready to start. So, dear colleagues, we start now the joint session of the three general committees. We are in the plenary. You have already the draft agenda in front of you, and uh, I ask you for the formal adoption of the draft agenda for today's joint committee sitting. Is the agenda adopted? The draft agenda is adopted, thank you. And now we go to the report by the OEC High Commissioner on National Minorities, Ambassador Knut Wollebeck. Ambassador Wollebeck, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, parliamentarians, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago, the CSE ministers met in Helsinki amid tumultuous times in Europe. The fall of the Iron Curtain and the breakup of Yugoslavia had, within a relatively short period of time, broken the European political architecture established at the end of World War II. While these times were awash with political euphoria and high hopes for the future, the festive mood was soon darkened by war and bloodshed that came to epitomize this period in some countries. Troubled by inter-ethnic strife and the rise of virulent nationalism, the CSE leaders responded by setting out the mandate for what would become the High Commissioner of National Minorities. Born in such extraordinary times, what is the relevance of this institution today? The mandate given to the first High Commissioner, the late Max van der Stuhl, remains unchanged. Quintessentially, this is to identify and seek early resolution of tensions involving national minorities that could threaten peace and stability within and between OSCE participating states. This mandate is unique in that it leaves me, as the High Commissioner, a lot of room to exercise my personal judgment, both as to where I should get involved and at least how I should engage. The mandate obliges me to work in confidence, which is why most of you rarely hear about my activities. 
But can an institution built upon such a mandate remain relevant in a world where politics are increasingly driven by publicity and with ever louder demands for transparency? Is there still room for silent diplomacy in the era of Twitter and Facebook? Of course, the HCNM has changed and adapted its work to the dynamic political landscape and will continue to do so. The institution is now actively engaged in countries I would never have anticipated, sometimes on issues we all thought were resolved. But still, I'm more struck by the similarities than the differences. Many issues remain as topical today as they were when the mandate was formulated. This testifies to the complexity and lasting relevance of the matters we deal with. There is no panacea to resolve inter-ethnic tensions. This work is a process that demands constant adjustments to our policies. As a result, my activities also change over time. As in 1993, the job of the HCNM remains to help states strike the right balance between the interests of the majority and minorities, and to sound the alarm bell if this proves impossible and conflict seems inevitable. The most important component of my conflict prevention work is to assist states in fulfilling their responsibilities to their citizens. To do so, I need to earn the trust and hopefully respect of both the state and the minorities. It is when offering advice on what are, at times, very sensitive political topics that the confidentiality aspect of my mandate proves its worth. In such circumstances, the requirement for confidentiality also helps me maintain a distance from what can be rather heated political debates. Let me give you an example of the issues uh, we are currently concerned with and how their manifestations have developed over time. Two weeks ago, I visited Skopje in the wake of a fresh outbreak of inter-ethnic tensions. But the backdrop for my work in this country differs significantly from the context Mr. van der Stuhl was dealing with. The peace agreement in 2001, the so-called Ohrid Framework Agreement, gave the Albanian minority far-reaching rights. Mr. van der Stuhl was himself active in the negotiation process, leading to this agreement. And there can be no doubt that the Ohrid Framework Agreement has been instrumental in stabilizing the situation and averting further conflict. To appreciate just how much has been achieved, it is enough to note that the largest political party of the Albanian minority is today part of a coalition government. Moving from a situation of armed insurrection to a political coalition in 10 years is certainly a great achievement. But, as I have repeatedly warned, and as the recent incidents illustrate, ethnic tensions persist. I've argued for a while that the time is now ripe to take one step further and go beyond Ohrid. It is not enough to ensure the rights of the minorities. They also need to be part of the wider society. Today, I am concerned about the widening ethnic divisions in this country, where very few bonds cross the ethnic lines. To ensure longer-term stability, there is a need to secure a more cohesive society. So, the main challenge still remains to build an integrated society that can provide for all ethnic groups. This is also the case in many other OSCE participating states, such as in the Balkans and beyond. To achieve stability in the longer run, any state must provide opportunities for its citizens to pursue their aspirations irrespective of their ethnicity. This is but one concrete example. There are many others. We are today actively working in Kyrgyzstan and the rest of Central Asia where my strategic goal is to improve the conditions for minorities and the communication between states, all in the interest of future stability. In Georgia, we continue to promote a more integrated society where minorities' interests are taken on board as the country charts its course for the future. The same goes for Ukraine, where the situation in Crimea remains a particular concern. 
In the Balkans, we work to bridge ethnic divides to create more cohesive societies where a citizen's opportunity to realize his or her potential will no longer be determined by ethnicity. More than a fundamental right, this is also a prerequisite for these countries to make full use of their human capital as they meet the challenges of modernization. <coughs> Throughout Central Europe, I promote minority rights and act as a facilitator when minority-related issues become an impediment to bilateral relations, be that in Poland, Lithuania, Hungary or Slovakia. Mr. President, as some of you will know, my institution is also actively working to develop a normative framework to support the relations between states and minorities. This normative work has developed considerably over time. In the 1990s, the main focus was to develop a set of standards for minority rights in practice. The earlier recommendations, such as the Hague recommendations on the educational rights of national minorities and the Oslo recommendations regarding the linguistic rights of national minorities, are now well established and set the standard throughout the OSCE area. In recent years, this normative work has become more closely interlinked with my political work. The bolzano bosn recommendations on national minorities in interstate relations are a prime example of this and demonstrate that our work remains firmly rooted in the first dimension of the OSCE. These recommendations also illustrate that my institution works not only on the relationship between ethnic groups within states, but also assists interstate relations when these are affected by national minority issues. The bolzano bosn recommendations have caused much debate among the participating states. While some have seen it as, a, as their cause to make these recommendations politically binding, others have argued strongly against them. Although I would have welcomed a more formal adoption, I am nonetheless happy to report that these recommendations are having a great impact. I often experience that both state parties and minority representatives build on the recommendations when developing their arguments. In my opinion, this clearly shows that the recommendations do fill a normative gap, but more importantly, by providing both state parties and minorities with a platform for discussion, these guidelines have had the intended effect of providing states with a framework within which they can communicate on minority issues. The recommendations also serve me well when we bring together representatives from neighboring countries as we have a common point of reference. Interestingly, in recent years, I have been increasingly involved in such matters within the European Union, where member states have sought our advice as a neutral third party to settle disputes and improve bilateral relations. We continue our work in several thematic areas, and I hope we can contribute further to the normative basis of our societies in the future. So, what does the future hold for the High Commissioner on National Minorities? As I have tried to illustrate, we see a pattern of recurrence throughout the OSCE area. Far too often, conflicts are not really resolved, the root causes are not properly addressed, rather the symptoms and the grievances most easily identified are dealt with in a hurry, before the focus shifts elsewhere. Left unaddressed, the underlying grievances still simmer only to re-emerge later when circumstances change. These problems can only be properly addressed through long-term structural work. It is time-consuming, often unrewarding, and certainly yields few quick political dividends for state authorities. But in an environment where the political attention spans are short and where superficial changes too often pass for real, I believe it is of fundamental importance that, we, importance that we do not allow ourselves to forget that the root causes still need to be addressed. And it is here that I see a valuable role for the quiet, old-school diplomacy of my institution. For this to be effective, however, a few elements remain as important now as they were 20 years ago when my institution was created. Firstly, 
To be effective, this institution must remain independent. Although the principle of decision-making by consensus is fundamental to the OSCE, and there are many arguments for consensus, it also comes with constraints. Consensus slows one's ability to act swiftly and decisively on sensitive matters. This is precisely why the three institutions were set up to be autonom autonomous in the first place, and it is as important and relevant today as it was then. I readily admit that this autonomy comes with challenges to transparency and accountability, but I really do not see any other way. Given the sensitivity of our work, the need for the parties involved to trust our impartiality and the importance of timely action, any more detailed political control can only hamper our ability to deliver on our mandate. Secondly, we can only be as efficient as you, politicians of the participating states, allow us to be. We are a small institution and it would not take much to undermine us. As parliamentarians, you are uniquely placed to keep OSCE issues on the agenda of your governments. By engaging on subjects relating to the OSCE and by holding your governments to account for their activities in the OSCE, or in some cases lack thereof, you can ensure that this organization stays relevant and useful and can serve the citizens of our states. We rely upon your interest and support. We are grateful for it and we hope to see it continue. Finally, even though we are an independent institution, we rely heavily on the rest of the OSCE, not only for practical support, but especially for our political and moral legitimacy. If the OSCE is not utilized and slips into political irrelevance, so will the High Commissioner on National Minorities. Mr. President, parliamentarians, Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention and your continued support. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you here today and for your interest in the work that we are doing. Thank you, dear Ambassador Wollebeck. We all know the excellent work you are doing. Uh, there are several members that have registered to speak. Please allow me to put a limit of three minutes, and I ask you to be, if it is possible, brief, less than three minutes. And uh, have in mind that it's a question and answer procedure, it's not a declaration of position. The first is uh, our colleague Rosa Aknazarova from Kyrgyzstan to be followed by our colleague Vladimir Kulako from Russian Federation. Rosa, you have the floor. Спасибо. В Кыргызской Республике проживает 83 этносов. Действует ансамблей народов Кыргызстана. Разработана концепция этнического развития. В избирательных законодательствах включают включены специальные меры, где предусмотрены 15-процентные представлены с национальных диаспор в парламенте. На сегодняшний день есть определенная представленность среди членов правительства и не, на, не тути, титульной нации. Но у нас на сегодняшний день есть, есть определенные проблемы. Например, хотя в Конституции написано государственный язык кыргызский язык, а официальный язык русский, изучение одного из иностранных языков, есть у нас регионы, например, Баткенская область, где изучают учебниками и пособиями соседних государств в таджикских школах на таджикском языке, которые не знают ни кыргызский язык, ни русский язык, ни иностранный язык, что незнание языка кыргызского языка, русского языка, иностранного не дают интегрироваться в систему управления, не дают не дает карьерного роста. Делопроизводство ведется у нас на кыргызском языке и на русском языке. Поэтому сейчас ведется работа с школами и с вузами по изучению кыргызских, русских и иностранных языков. В настоящее время в нашей стране идет активный процесс постконфликтного урегулирования, в которых участвуют официальные лица и все слои гражданского общества. Спасибо. Thank you very much. I go now to Vladimir Kulakov and uh, every two parliamentarians in a row, I'll give the floor to Mr. Wolleberg to give the answer. 
Александр Вергар. Да, спасибо. спасибо, господин председатель. Уважаемый господин Волебек, уважаемые коллеги, вот то, о чем говорила моя коллега из Киргизии в отношении киргизского языка, русского языка и вообще статусного языка Киргизии, безусловно, это также будет входить и в мой вопрос. Почему? Потому что все, с чем сталкиваются бывшие республики СССР, ныне самостоятельные государства, это связано с распадом Советского Союза. Российская сторона, безусловно, господин Волебек, поддерживает вашу активную позицию по вопросам обеспечения языковых прав национальных меньшинств. Призываем вас также не ослаблять внимание положению русского язычного населения в странах постсоветского пространства. Но я бы хотел сказать о том референдуме, который прошел в Латвии по вопросу придания русскому языку статуса государственного. Из проживающих в Латвии полутора миллионов граждан за такой статус высказались 300 тысяч. Однако 319 тысяч человек при этом были лишены права участвовать в референдуме в силу того, что имеют паспорт так называемого негражданина Латвии. Конечно, это право народа определиться, и мы итоги референдума знаем. Также я бы хотел сказать о том, что даже в семьях, где муж, допустим, русскоязычный, а жена латышка, тоже не было консенсуса в этом плане. Я видел информацию, видел кадры, которые были сняты во время референдума, когда муж говорил, что он будет голосовать за придание русскому языку статуса государственного, а жена латышка говорила наоборот нет. Поэтому, господин Верховный комиссар, мне бы хотелось, с учетом того, что я здесь сказал, просто узнать, как вы расцениваете итоги прошедшего референдума в Латвии, и не могли бы вы прокомментировать шаги, предпринимаемые возглавляемым вам институтом в деле защиты русского язычного населения. Спасибо большое. Mr. President, I um, guess uh, I can combine answers to the two representatives from Kyrgyzstan and the Russian Federation. Um, languages or language uh, is very important uh, for any, anybody of us. Um, it is not up to me or my institution to decide what should be the state language in a country or how many state languages you should have. That varies from country to country and that is up to the country to decide. What is important for me and where I get involved is partly to make sure that the minorities have the right to the mother tongue education according to uh, Council of Europe conventions and whatever other conventions there are. Uh, we have clear uh, decisions uh, saying that the minorities have a right to education in the mother tongue and this is something that we discuss with the, with the governments but in addition to discussing this, we, I think one of, the, uh, one of the areas where we have achieved quite a bit is then through multilingual education. We are helped in providing assistance, uh, guidance, uh, expertise, and we second people to ministries of education in order to facilitate this uh, education in the minority languages. And in addition to that, whatever might be the state language, we have also worked very actively in order to uh, teach and provide the education knowledge of the state language to the minorities. And this has particularly been an, an um, a, what was a, not a necessarily a problem, but a challenge after the collapse of the Soviet Union, because many of the new states, republics, established new state languages, while Russian had been the, the lingua franca earlier. And so for, for those people who didn't master the state language, also to be able to master it, has been fundamental for their participation in public life. And, this is, and also to keep the jobs, for that matter, often. And we have then had very practical 
schools, colleges, classes. Georgia is a good example there where we established language houses and where the Georgian government now has taken over this because they saw this as being useful and they run these um, um, schools themselves for the minorities. And, but the same has happened in other countries. And so, yes, we have to provide education and safeguard the language of the minorities, but we also have to help them master the state language for them to be properly participating in public life and integrated in society. Thank you very much. We continue with our colleague Valtis Lepins from Latvia to be followed by our colleague Sultanov from Kazakhstan. Please be brief and if it possible you. less than three minutes. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that we appreciate very much indeed the work that Mr. Volbeck is doing in the EDSO region to um, prevent conflict and strife. Um, but I would like to comment on the results of the language referendum that we just held in Latvia on uh, February the 18th. I want to draw your attention that there was only 17% support for Russian as a second official language in Latvia. And the reason for this is quite clear. There is no reason for having an official language, uh, Russian as an official language at any level in Latvia, because all those people who speak Russian, and there are some who speak Russian only, have no problems in making themselves understood in Latvia. I also want to add that we do have multilingual schools. We have seven of them in seven languages. And um, the uh, Russians in that sense have absolutely no problems and I think the demands that were raised were really strictly political and probably had some sort of um, essence arose in Russia as opposed to Latvia. It is indeed the Latvian nation that feels under threat. We feel that our language is under threat and we will do everything possible to protect our language, at the same time to continue the multilingual education system which we already had before the Second World War. As in, in terms of the uh, non-Latvians living in Latvia, we have a very liberal naturalization policy. The problem is that um, the, uh, many of the Russians really don't need Latvian, as I mentioned, as a language, uh, Russian is sufficient for them, and in fact the um, rate of application is small, and we've done everything possible to raise it. But on a personal level, I'd like to add that I think the naturalization program probably is not working all that well, because most of the people who voted for Russian as a second language in Latvia probably realizing what it would do to Latvia, were the very people who were naturalized. So I have a question there. Are we naturalizing people, and are they becoming loyal citizens of Latvia? And I have real questions on that. I, have many I don't speak Russian myself, but I have many examples where I have not been able to converse with a Russian person who does not speak Latvian. And one of those was a person observing our recent, uh, the, the very referendum that we referred to. So take it from me, please. We are doing everything possible to lower the level of strife. If there is any, there really is not any level of strife in Latvia. And please. we certainly don't want anybody from the outside interfering to uh, meddle in our affairs and to stoke the flames of, of, of ethnic uh, strife. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I go to our colleague Sultanov from Kazakhstan. Please back the three minutes time. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Уважаемые коллеги, Кнут, хочу прежде всего поблагодарить верховного комиссара посла Кнута Волебат. Как всегда за содержательный доклад хочу поддержать Ваши мысли, озвученные сегодня, и мысли Вашего доклада о поиске новых форм, моделей обеспечения соблюдения равных прав всех этнических групп в пространстве ОБСЕ. Вы справедливо сказали, что в реальной жизни этого добиться не так уж просто. Нужны годы, нужны добрые традиции человеческих взаимоотношений, нужны адекватные меры как правовых, так и культурных 
как между людьми, так и между властью и обществом. Исторический казахстанский народ сформировался на многонациональной основе, как общество, объединяющее более чем 130 этнических групп. Сегодня, господин Волебак, я хотел сделать несколько комментариев и предложений к вашим будущим докладам, так как мы с вами сотрудничаем не первый год. Я на этой стороне, господин посол. И что э, сейчас одним из центральных вопросов, определяющих характер и содержание гражданской общности в Казахстане, является соотношение гражданской и этнической идентификации. Казахстанская модель межэтнического и межрелигиозного согласия предоставляет собой сложную межрелигиозную конфигурацию и помещенную в социально-политический контекст государственного общественного развития республики. Система межэтнических, межрелигиозных отношений в Казахстане достаточно стабильная в целом. Она обладает высокой степенью самосохранения и воспроизводства. Но вместе с тем эту стабильность надо сохранять, надо сознательно ее поддерживать, так как идущие в стране и в мире процессы не всегда способствуют сохранению стабильности. Очень многие из этих событий из этих всех процессов, они могут повлиять на наши ценности не самым позитивным образом. Они, напротив, имеют часто дестабилизирующее влияние. И это, yeah, коллеги, мне кажется, на будущем надо учесть. И учесть при разработке законодательства, господин посол, в ваших перспективных материалах. Спасибо. Thank you very much. And uh, now I ask Ambassador to answer, and I have to make that clear. There were two colleagues that, when Mr. Wolfberg went to the podium, they asked to put questions. I have to remind to all of us that it goes until 11 o'clock that somebody could inscript, be inscripted. So please. I'll give to those two the floor for one minute for a question, but I'll stop here, because it's impossible. We have the minister, and we have, and also, minister must leave. Oh. So, we'll put the pressure to ourselves. We respect that you have obligation to leave, but so please, Ambassador B., And I ask D'Amico and uh, Sir Peter Bottomley to withdraw because uh, there is a pressure from the minister sides about the time. Uh, is that accepted from uh, our colleague D'Amico and Sir Peter Bottomley? Uh, uh, Sir Peter yes. Bottomley is yes. withdrawing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. So it's the final question, so those two. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I can also be very brief because I suppose, uh, as far as I understand, both from the Honorable Representative of, from Latvia and my friend uh, Mr. Sultanov, there were more statements than actually questions. But I would beg to disagree somewhat with the Honorable Representative from Latvia when he says that um, Russian is sufficient for ethnic Russians. They don't need uh, Latvia. I think all of us need to know and master the state language in, all, in any country in order to be a full-fledged citizen. And I think it is important that we, both the states, uh, take their responsibility, but that we continue also then to support uh, the work of the states in, uh, in achieving uh, this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, all, for your job, for your answers to our questions. And now is the address by the representative of OECE chairperson person in office, Minister of State for European Affairs of Ireland, Mrs. Lucida Crichton. Mrs. Crichton, you have the floor. Distinguished members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, It is a pleasure to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to address the winter meeting of the Parliamentary Assembly. It is my firm belief that parliamentarians have a vital role to, to play in ensuring the effectiveness of the OSCE and the implementation of our commitments. 
Ireland assumed the chairmanship of the OSCE this, this year for the first time. This gives us a unique opportunity to make a tangible contribution to the promotion of European peace and security. The OSCE plays a significant role in conflict resolution and in the promotion of peace, security and respect for human rights and the, role of, the rule of law. Its cooperative and inclusive nature is, I believe, its very best asset. An important part of this cooperation is the work carried out by the Parliamentary Assembly, in particular the Assembly's role in facilitating inter-parliamentary dialogue across the OSCE region. On my own behalf and on behalf of the Chairperson in Office, the Thánaiste and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr Eamon Gilmore, I wish to emphasise the readiness of the Irish Chairmanship to work closely with the Parliamentary Assembly in order to further our common objectives. I think and hope that you will agree that the need for effective multilateralism is as compelling today as when the Helsinki Final Act was agreed all those decades ago. This need is all the more acute in view of the political and economic crises facing a great number of our states. As the 40th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act beckons in 2015, it would be timely to reflect on the contribution which the OSCE can make in tackling these global challenges and on how the organisation can ensure its continuing effectiveness and relevance. Mr President, I will now turn to some of the priorities of the Irish Chairmanship. In his address to the Permanent Council in January, the Chairman in office emphasised that Ireland would be pragmatic and fair-minded in its approach. Our aim is to elaborate a set of priorities that will ensure balance and coherence across all three dimensions. We will strive to achieve these concrete results through a small and balanced package of decisions and declarations for adoption at the Dublin Ministerial Council in December. Ireland has always attached importance to the human dimension and we will be striving in particular to make progress in this field. The threat to fundamental freedoms and human rights in a number of OSCE participating states continues to be a cause of real concern. We will work closely with ODIR, the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities and the Office of the Representative of Freedom of the Media to address specific instances where OSCE commitments are not being met and to take forward a number of key priorities. The Parliamentary Assembly can play a significant role in this work, helping to ensure that all channels of communication remain open. Our key priority in this dimension will be internet freedom. Freedom of expression constitutes a basic building block for an open and free society. A free, uncensored and pluralist media is essential in any society to ensure freedom of expression. In little more than 20 years, The internet has been transformed from a tool largely used by academics to a vital platform, one that is central to our daily lives. Just as much as a conversation on the telephone uh, or a private chat in a Viennese coffee house, communication on the internet falls clearly within the scope of the right to freedom of expression. The Irish Chairmanship plans to organise a conference in Dublin in June at which we will aim to move towards a common understanding of the myriad issues raised by the internet and new media. Human dimension events are also planned on a range of other topics. We intend to organise meetings focused on freedom of association and assembly, freedom of religion and belief, trafficking in human beings and racism and intolerance in sport. We will also oversee a review of human dimension events and will seek to ensure that the events remain relevant, inclusive of all stakeholders and effective in evaluating the implementation of human dimension commitments. Mr President, the Irish Chairmanship is deeply committed to the OSCE's election observation activities, which are fundamental to our work as a community of states committed to respect for human rights, democracy and the rule of law. We will provide all necessary support to ODIR and to the Parliamentary Assembly in this crucial area of work. 
We hope that states holding elections in 2012 will issue timely invitations to observe them in accordance with their OSCE commitments. We will also work to ensure appropriate follow-up to recommendations made in election observation mission reports. Central to the enhancement of security in the OSCE region will be the confidence and security building measures adopted within the politico-military dimension. I understand that there will be a special debate on the future of conventional arms control in the OSCE area later this afternoon. This debate is timely and I look forward to hearing the outcome of your discussions. As Chair, we will call on participating states to reflect on the building blocks available to us in the areas of confidence and security building measures, arms control, conflict prevention and resolution and transnational threats. This will be the theme for the annual security review conference in June. We will also continue the good work carried out last year in updating the Vienna document, despite some existing implementation problems, and we'll work on this with the three chairs of the Forum for Security Cooperation during 2012. We will take forward work on tackling international, transnational threats such as organised crime, cyber threats, illicit drugs, terrorism and trafficking, challenges which face all of our societies. In this regard, we welcome the establishment of the new Transnational Threats Directorate within the OSCE Secretariat and are confident that this will help to strengthen coordination and coherence of OSCE efforts. Mr. President, the economic and environmental dimension has a particular resonance today, given the global economic and environmental challenges with which we are all confronted. I know that with your committee meeting uh, yesterday, there was a special debate on the current economic and financial crisis in Europe. The financial crisis has demonstrated how poor govern governance can lead to economic decline and how good governance must be the foundation for the road to recovery. Our central theme for this year's Economic and Environmental Forum is the promotion of security and stability through good, good governance. There will be a particular focus on measures to counter corruption, money laundering and terrorist financing. The first preparatory conference took place in Vienna earlier this month entitled Anti-Money Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism. The next will be held in Dublin in April and address promoting good governance and combating corruption in support of socio-economic development. Conflict resolution remains at the core of the OSCE's mandate, a fact which was highlighted by the agreement of the conflict cycle decision at Vilnius. We will take forward the implementation of this decision, which will assist the OSCE to deepen its, deepen its involvement in all phases of the conflict cycle and to strengthen its capacity to tackle conflict from prevention to resolution and post-conflict rehabilitation. As Chair in Office, we will seek to make progress towards lasting settlements of a number of conflicts in the OSCE area. We have nominated two special representatives, Ambassador Podrick Murphy and Ambassador Erwin Fuere, to assist and advise us on these issues. They are cooperating with international actors on the ground, as well as maintaining close ca contact with the parties. The Chairmanship will seek, in particular, to promote confidence building measures and to address humanitarian needs. As regards Moldova and Transnistria, we look forward to welcoming the participants of the 5 plus 2 talks to Dublin next week. We stand ready to build on the momentum created following the successful resumption of official talks at the end of last year. Ireland strongly supports the Geneva discussions as the best forum for facilitating engagement and providing a way forward in relation to the situation in Georgia. The first discussions under the chairmanship will take place next month. We also commend the continuing work of the Min Minsk Group co-chairs in addressing the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We look forward to working closely with the co-chairs and members of the Min Minsk Group throughout our chairmanship. We in Ireland can empathise only too well with those who are engaged in seemingly intractable conflicts. In Northern Ireland, the courage of leaders on both sides to negotiate and make compromises in the interest of peace 
backed by the perseverance of the British and Irish governments and by international support, has re resulted in a lasting settlement. Governments and by international... Uh, while each conflict situation is different, I believe that sharing this experience can support and encourage effort, efforts to resolve conflicts in the OSCE region. With this in mind, the chairperson in office will hold a conference in Dublin on the 27th of April, which will aim to draw on the experience of the Northern Ireland peace process as a case study. We will be joined at the conference by the First and Deputy First Ministers of the Northern Ireland Executive, by Senator George Mitchell of the United States, and by His Excellency Marty Azdari, former President of Finland, all of, who, all of whom played crucial roles in the peace process. Mr. President, as I said at the beginning, the cooperative and inclusive nature of the OSCE means that it is uniquely positioned to play a significant role in building a comprehensive security community. A busy year lies in store for the OSCE and the Irish Chairmanship. In addition to the priorities which I've outlined, we will take forward the day-to-day -day work of the organisation, as well as specific taskings given to us by, partic by participating states. I wish to welcome in particular the encouraging Ministerial Council decision in Vilnius on Mongolia's application to become a participating state. The Chairmanship hopes to be able to welcome Mongolia as the 57th participating state by the time of the Dublin Ministerial Council. Building on the decision of the Vilnius Ministerial Council, we will work to enhance the OSCE's engagement with the Partners for Cooperation, together with the Lithuanian and Ukrainian chairs of the Asian and Mediterranean contact groups. The security in the Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian area cannot be isolated from international events. We witnessed at first hand last year the dramatic events in North Africa, as well as the natural disasters in Japan and Thailand. The OSCE has acquired a considerable body of experience, expertise and best practice, which we are ready to share with our partner countries. I know that the Parliamentary Assembly has been very active in reaching out to the partner countries and I com commend your activities in this regard. We are also keen to move forward on issues related to the legal status of the OSCE and our aim is to equip the organisation with the legal protections and status that it requires to achieve its core objectives. To this end, we have commissioned Ambassador John Ber Bernard, the former permanent representative of Denmark to the OSCE, to take a fresh look at the issues related to, to the legal status. I am confident that through effective cooperation with all relevant actors, including of course the Parliamentary Assembly, we can achieve good progress during 2012. We look forward to working with you and thank you very much for your attention. We also look forward to work with you, dear Minister. I have colleagues in the list, Dean Allison from Canada, Tony Lloyd from United Kingdom, Michel Voisin from France, Aram Safarian from Armenia. I propose to hear the four of them and you will answer to all of them. So, I start with Dean Allison from Canada, please the rule of three minutes to be respected. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Ireland for its 2012 chairmanship of the OSCE. My question concerns the chairmanship's priorities, specifically regarding strengthening human rights in the OSCE region. <clears throat> We've heard over the course of this winter meeting several disturbing cases of the violation of human rights in the region. The Parliament of Canada and the Canadian government have been concerned in particular about the case of Yulia Tymoshenko, leading to an all-party take-note debate in the House of Commons and a briefing on the state of democracy in Ukraine by the Committee on Foreign Affairs, which I chair. The Canadian Prime Minister and the Foreign Affairs Minister have also sent letters to the Ukrainian President in which they have expressed in very strong terms Canada's concerns about Ukraine's commitment to democratic principles and justice. In addition, Three Canadian doctors were part of the international medical team that just a week ago offered an independent assessment of Ms. Timoshenko's health. My question is, 
what plans does the Irish Chairmanship have to ensure that human rights and democracy, including a legitimate and active opposition, remain tenants of the OSCE and are respected in the cases that we have heard about at our meetings, in particular in Ukraine, which will be the chair in office in 2013? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean. Now I go to Tony Lloyd from United Kingdom. Tony, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Can, can I also welcome the, uh, the Irish Chair in office here with, with us today and uh, with our thanks for the, the remarks that, uh, that um, she made to us al already. The, the OSCE has never been afraid to take on issues um, even beyond the OSCE borders, and in particular, um, in recent years, the, uh, the, the Partnership for Peace stretches across in, into the Mediterranean, and we, we uh, have worked actively with our colleagues on, um, on, uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean. Obviously, at the moment, one of the things that does grip the world rightly is the situation in Syria. Um, it's not simply human tragedy. It actually is a modern outrage, and the humanitarian crisis there is one of absolutely yeah. enormous proportions. Um, this does affect the OSCE. It certainly affects Turkey, um, who already houses many refugees, and it does affect, in any case, stability in the OSCE region. Um, how far is it possible for the chair in office to use that office to bring legitimate pressure to bear on the OSCE family to work practically for peace, both at the United Nations, particularly those who seek to block progress at the United Nations? Thank you, Tony. I go now to Michel Voisin from France. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Madame la Représentante en exercice, bienvenue. À Astana, en décembre 2010, tous les États participants se sont accordés sur l'objectif de construire une communauté de sécurité. Et nous constatons que nous en sommes bien loin aujourd'hui en ce qui concerne la dimension politico-militaire. En effet, quel constat peut-on faire sur les deux instruments juridiques principaux dans cette dimension L'impossibilité à ce jour d'apporter une réponse à la hauteur du constat partagé de leur obsolescence. Le traité sur les forces conventionnelles en Europe apparaît suspendu. Pourtant, le régime des armements conventionnels a été présenté par beaucoup comme devant être pérennisé autour de ces grands principes vérifiabilité, limitation et transparence, mais réadapté en fonction des réalités politiques et militaires du XXIe siècle. Quant au document de Vienne de 1999, sur les mesures de confiance et de sécurité, je qualifierai la version 2011 de décevante, en dépit pourtant d'un large soutien exprimé parmi les États participants pour sa modernisation. Quelles mesures, Madame la Présidente, pourrait-elle entreprendre pour faciliter une réponse positive aux attentes très fortes relatives aux documents de Vienne de 1999 Мы заметили, что ирландское председательство уделяет особое внимание вопросу урегулирования конфликтов и защиты прав человека. В 21 веке конфликты могут быть урегулированы только на основе защиты прав человека. И поэтому нам необходимо единое понимание прав человека на всем пространстве ОБСЕ и в особенности среди сторон, вовлеченных в конфликте. Очевидно, что трудно признать право на самоопределение противоположной стороны, если свои собственные граждане лишены возможности волеизъявления путем использования своих прав и основных свобод. Более того, существующие конфликты зачастую используются для оправдания нарушений прав и основных свобод всего общества. Мой первый вопрос. Что мы можем сделать для изменения ситуации, чтобы права человека не оставались заложником конфликтов, а стали следствием их урегулирования? И второй вопрос. Мы знаем, что ирландское председательство оказывает всяческое содействие со председателем Минской группы ОБСЕ, особенно в свете их предложений 
предложений, которые направлены на консолидацию режима прекращения огня и отвод снайперов. Хочу с горечью отметить, что вчера от снайперского огня был убит военнослужащий армянской армии на севере Армении на армяно-азербайджанской границе. Намеревается ли председательство ОБСЕ выступить с новым призывом ко всем сторонам выполнить предложение сопредседателей Минской группы ОБСЕ? Спасибо. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to the, the uh, warm and welcoming uh, comments from, from the floor. Um, firstly, to uh, address the issue of Ukraine, um, I think I can, I can certainly join with our Canadian friends in expressing a deep concern about the situation in Ukraine. Um, it's something that I follow closely uh, and that my government fo follows closely. Um, and indeed I met uh, in very very recent times with, um, with Yulia Tymoshenko's daughter who is uh, valiantly campaigning um, to draw, draw attention uh, to, the, to the situation uh, in relation to her mother. Um, Ireland as a member of the European Union obviously we share the, the concerns of the EU which have been expressed uh, in very frank and forthright terms uh, by Cathy Ashton um, in relation to, to recent developments and we're working very closely uh, with the Ukraine and the OSCE obviously um, in, uh, in our Troika formation to ensure um, that the Ukrainian share is successful um, in advancing the values and um, also the effectiveness of the OSCE. So um, we will continue with that work. Um, it's obviously uh, not easy, um, but, uh, but we are, are certainly uh, not, uh, not uh, in any sense going to be um, slow in coming forward uh, with um, strong words, and uh, we will very much support uh, efforts to, to ensure that, um, that the, the situation in Ukraine is resolved uh, as quickly as possible. Um, in relation to, to Syria, um, well, it's, it's difficult. Um, Syria is not a partner organization, uh, as you know, um, but we have a, a very strong interest in, in uh, addressing the, the, um, the huge difficulties um, in relation to activity, activ activities in Syria. Um, we are part of the Friends of Syria. Um, the chairman in office, um, Minister Gilmore, uh, is participating in that, that meeting uh, this week. Um, and we will work and continue to work and fully support the efforts of the EU, uh, the UN, um, and of course um, the League of Arab, Arab States. Uh, to try to bring pressure to bear on the Syrian regime. Uh, so that is certainly something that we will continue uh, our efforts on. Uh, in relation to the, um, the question pertaining to Astana and the security uh, community, well, we very strongly support um, the concept of a security community. Uh, unfortunately, since Astana, progress has been uh, rather slow, uh, slower than we would like. Um, for instance, uh, the arms control regime in Europe continues to suffer gridlock. Um, so that is something that we are committed to, to trying to address. We feel that there is, um, there is an urgent need to develop um, a multi-year perspective. And that is why we are exploring uh, with Ukraine, Serbia and Swi Switzerland and the outgoing chair, Lithuania, Lithuania the concept of Helsinki plus 40. Um, this forthcoming anniversary in 2012, or 2015 gives us uh, a very good opportunity, I think, to renew our common commitments and our common vision. So we certainly uh, will, um, will uh, pursue that. Um, and further in relation to the Vienna document, um, the Forum for Security and Cooperation continues to work um, on the Vienna document, and we hope to see progress on some further amendments um, shortly. Um, and then, uh, finally, uh, in relation to human rights, well, uh, obviously the, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh cont continues to be um, a matter of some concern to us, uh, and I think to all partners in the OSCE. 
Um, Ireland, uh, as chair, will continue to do all that we can to find a way forward to, to the ongoing conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. We welcome the outcome of um, the Sochi meeting last month, and we urge the parties to continue to engage with each other. Um, our special representative, who I mentioned in my introductory remarks for the Southern Caucasus, uh, Podrick Murphy, has visited the region and uh, will, will continue to work very closely uh, with all of the, the parties, and we will so strongly support, as chairman in office, the work of the Minsk group of co-chairs uh, on this conflict. So our our commitment is clear and we will uh, hope to deliver some progress as the year goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We are sure that your chair will be a successful one and uh, you must be sure that the Parliamentary Assembly serves all those goals and uh, we hope that at the end, in Dublin, we will have achievements in those areas. We are with you. Have it in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We understand that you have to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, dear colleague, we go now the number four item of the draft of the our agenda, the adopted agenda, is the report by the OEC Parliamentary Assembly Special Representative on Gender Issues, and I call our colleague from Canada, Hedy Fry, to have the floor. Thank you, Hedy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I can get my whips out, Mr. Chair, and that might help. Uh, Monsieur le Président, Chers amis, comme toujours, c'est un plaisir de parler avec vous du sujet d'égalité entre les sexes. It's important that we continue to explore and raise awareness of gender issues, so I want to share with you some thoughts about a theme I will be exploring for my annual report. Avant tout, je tiens toutefois à vous mettre au courant d'une décision prise par le Conseil ministériel à Vilnius concernant la parité des sexes, décision qui fait écho à la résolution adoptée par l'Assemblée parlementaire à Belgrade. Rejoignant notre résolution sur la parité entre les sexes, la migration et l'indépendance économique, la décision du Conseil ministériel relative à la promotion de l'égalité des chances pour les femmes dans la sphère économique fait ressortir certains des faits dont nous avons connaissance au sujet du rôle des femmes dans l'économie, les problèmes qui restent et la façon de les résoudre. The Vilnius document recognizes the contribution that women make towards the country's economy. But what they wanted to point out was that women continue to face inequities in terms of labor market participation. And they are asking member states to collect and analyze data about the obstacles that can continue to exist that prevent women from fulfilling their full potential in the economic sphere. At the same time, one of those obstacles they are speaking about is the sharing of domestic work between men and women. Now, they also wanted to bring attention to women's entrepreneurial and other work-related skills and to incorporate gender aspects into migration policies in order to, among other aspects, prevent human trafficking. And they also wish, at the Vilnius document, to strengthen policy and legal measures that would facilitate and protect equal opportunity for women in the labor market. Now, when the Ministerial Council and the Parliamentary Assembly find common ground and can make parallel projects a priority, 
a great deal can be accomplished. When the message about the reality of continued gender imbalance in the OSCE area is delivered together by all bodies and their special representatives, it is as if the stars are aligned and a real breakthrough can be achieved. And so I'm excited that we are agreeing the Parliamentary Assembly and, of course, the OSCE on certain aspects. So I'm going to be participating in a project with ODIR to look at cross-party caucuses in the OSC region, women's caucuses, that is. And we're going to see if we can gather valuable information about how parliaments in the OSC deal with women's issues, the machinery that they have in place, and how those machinery and the issues help to influence the political agenda of the countries. So we will be carrying out a survey together to identify parliaments that host women's caucuses. Now, now this project, we hope, will result in a better understanding of whether these caucuses are effective, and it will collect best practices where there are any, and look at lessons learned. At the same time, it will help us understand the different barriers faced in the different regions. Now, there is no magic solution, my friends. There is no one answer. I'm sure that we will find that different parliamentary procedures and practices and different ways of electing parliamentarians will require flexible solutions. So I hope I can count on you to serve as a focal point of contact when your parliament is approached. I encourage all of you who are here today to cooperate with ODEA on this project and to provide the responses they seek in their survey, which you will receive later this spring. And of course, the results will be, re will be relayed to you in autumn. Now, I'm sure that you all must agree that gathering information and gathering data is an important first step in any public policy making. And in this case, improving representation of women in our parliaments and in our delegations. Now, next, I want to share with you very quickly some key highlights from the OSCE Secretary General's annual evaluation report on the implementation of the 2004 OSCE Action Plan on the Promotion of Gender Equality. And I'm sure I'm not going to be surprising you when I tell you that there is still need for increased numbers of women as heads, of deputy, as heads and deputy heads of OSCE field missions and within the leadership of OSCE institutions. There is still not enough attention paid to women's issues in the OSCE first dimension, and that is in political and military affairs. Now, if you compare this lack of attention in the first dimension to the successful work being done by the OSCE on the economic status of women, which I addressed in my annual report last year, there are a number of projects integrating gender within the economic and environmental areas. So we must be thankful for some progress and continue to push for attention in other areas. Now, in terms of the six priority areas, there has been a tremendous amount of work on the part of several field missions, including those in Tajikistan, Albania, Kosovo, Skopje, Montenegro, Ukraine, Baku, Bosnia, Astana and Herzegovina, and Moldova to strengthen legal and policy frameworks concerning gender equality, discrimination, and domestic violence, and enhancing the role of women in the promotion of peace and security. So I applaud the Secretary General's call to revise the 2004 Gender Plan to develop well-defined targets, clear timelines, monitoring and accountability mechanisms, because without these, we can continue talking about this at every report I make, and nothing will happen. Now, c'est pourquoi j'accueille avec plaisir la nomination de Madame June Zietlin à titre de représentant spécial de la présidence irlandaise en exercice ainsi que la nouvelle conseillère principale concernant les questions sexo-spécifiques au secrétariat de l'OSCE, Madame Miroslava Behem. Je me réjouis d'avance des relations fructueuses et axées sur la collaboration que nous entendrions. J'espère que nous trois, de concert avec les autres intervenants pour les questions sexo-spécifiques au sein de la OSCE, pouvons promouvoir le souci de l'égalité des sexes au sein de notre organisation et donner une impulsion au processus de mise à jour du plan d'action en faveur de l'égalité des sexes.
Le président FTMU a déclaré à plusieurs reprises des résultats que peut donner la collaboration entre l'OSCE et le jargon parlementaire. J'abonde dans le même sens. Le rapport du secrétaire général indique que le CEO, le OSCE progresse dans la bonne direction, euh, quoi quoi lentement, mais qu'il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire avant d'atteindre l'objectif d'assurer l'égalité entre les sexes. Now, we at the Parliamentary Assembly are not without our own faults regarding gender balance. Our elections for officers at the annual session last year did not result in any gains at all regarding gender representation on committees and vice presidents as we had all hoped. I will repeat that long-standing refrain that we have to set an example in our own shop here and within our own institution. We have seen no change in the composition of the Bureau. Of the 21 positions, we have only elected four, 19 percent, who are women. We must improve this imbalance. So I reissue my challenge to you, fellow delegates, to raise that target to 30% in 2012. Now, I have to say to the women here at the OSCEPA, however, you cannot continue to sit back. You must step up and put your names forward. If your names are not there, you're not going to lose, but you're not going to win a seat either. So I would like to see a lot of women in this room and in your delegations putting their names up next time we have elections. Now, our work at the OSCPA and the OSC... So I want you men to twist the arms of the women on your delegation and make them put their names forward. Our work at the OSCPA and at the OSCE is invaluable, not only to raise awareness about gender issues and equality, but also to eventually make equality a reality in the lives of men and women. Now, while it seems as that this journey towards equality on sex is never ending, the objective is worth it. If we can create opportunity for all of our citizens, men and women, to participate fully and contribute fully to the overall progress of our nations, we would have done something very important. Now, this means that even countries of the OSC where we believed we have achieved gender equality, and these are the Nordic countries, we need to be watchful for erosion. For instance, in Canada, where we believe that we have done very well with regard to gender equality, there was a shocking case recently where four women in the same family, including three teenage daughters, were murdered by their father and one of their brothers because they were women and in the name of family honor. Now the father, his current wife and the brother of the girls were found guilty by the courts of premeditated murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. There is no death penalty in Canada. But the point here is that equality between men and women, the freedom and autonomy of both is not a simple equation. There are subsets of race, culture, religion, ethnicity, indigenous status, refugee and immigrant status, sexual orientation and gender identity that act as double, triple and multiple barriers to gender equality. And this egregious example of honor killing in a multicultural and progressive country like Canada serves as an example that we must continue to be on guard. In the region of the OECE, There is not a single country that can pretend that they do not have to keep their eye on the ball in terms of continuing gender equality. And this, this leads to my, my final point. In Monaco, the introduction of my annual report topic will be about exactly this, the cross-cutting issue of gender and minority status and the condition of women belonging to national, religious and ethnic minorities, notably indigenous and Roma and Sinti women in the OSCE region. And to a certain extent, this topic or is an extension of the theme explored last year. Having established a basic understanding of how women face barriers that prevent them from achieving economic autonomy, I want to now explore how the most vulnerable of these women, those that belong to minority groups, face additional challenges that prevent them from participating not only in economic activities, but in the political and social life of their societies. These include access to education and employment, healthcare services, electoral office, and the subsequent poverty 
exploitation, susceptibility to trafficking, slavery, and domestic and societal violence, many of them face because of systemic discrimination and stereotyping. In the end, these women face a double burden. They are women and they belong to a minority group. Minority women are present in all of our countries, but their access to and their participation in political, economic, and social life varies. In some cases, there are tremendous differences even within societies. For instance, again, and I want to point to my own country, Canada, despite the rights and protections guaranteed to minority groups under the law, there are still examples of societal and domestic violence like the one that I told you about earlier. Aboriginal women in Canada have the protection of our Constitution, yet they are still the most vulnerable women in our society. CEDAW, the United Nations Commission for Women's Equality, has decided to conduct an inquiry into 550 cases of missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada. The government of the province of British Columbia, wherein lies Vancouver, as in Vancouver de Vladivostok, is also conducting its own similar public inquiry which underscores the point that sometimes the rule of law may not be sufficient to prevent violence against women until after the violence has occurred. And so we must take systemic efforts at prevention. We must continue to be vigilant. Public education, awareness programs, school programs, and sensitivity training within the institutions of our police, our justice institutions, our courts, are also needed on a continuing basis to teach the importance of non-discrimination, of respect for each other, and the right of every human being to coexist in dignity and respect within civilized society. While I've referenced Canada, the strides made by women belonging to minority groups in the United States is well documented, but success and advancement for all women is still not realized in that country because of minority status. In Europe, the plight of the Roma and Sinti people is experienced differently by its women than its men. Moreover, migration patterns over years, decades, and even centuries has meant that throughout the OSCE region, women belonging to ethnic and national minorities or indigenous peoples find themselves alienated to some degree from the larger society without the means by which their voices and concerns can be heard. And this is where we as parliamentarians must become their voices. If we are not committed to the betterment of our societies, who will be? As parliamentarians, we know that the only way to change the status of these women is with sound policies and legislation where necessary. However, the barrier to doing this may be constrained, in part by the lack of gender and ethnicity segregated data. We do not have information on social issues such as exclusion, access to education, employment, among other factors. We, the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, can and must begin to play a leadership role, highlight this issue to our governments, and exchange best practices at these meetings about how to promote a deeper engagement of minority women in our societies. I don't think any single one of us have all of the answers, so we need to talk to each other. We need to share with each other. I encourage all of you to consider the condition of minority women in your countries and to contribute to and exchange on this topic at the annual meeting in Monaco. I hope we can explore this issue further at the gender luncheon and that you will support my supplementary motion. But I want to add one last thing before I close, and that is security is not only about what goes on at our borders. Security is not just the person outside our gates. Security is about having people within our societies who are not excluded, because people who are excluded will rise up and seek equality if we do not give it to them first. So I tell you, this is an issue for security within the OSCE. And so I value your ideas and input, and nous sommes tous engagés ensemble. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Heidi. C'est la Marianne de la Révolution française. Uh, I have three colleagues in the list. Jordana Komic from Serbia, Rosa Knazarova from Kyrgyzstan, and Snorre Wallen from Norway. So I'll give the floor to each of, of the colleagues, and you will answer 
to all of them together, Heidi. Thank you. We start with Jordana Komic from Serbia. Jordana, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will try to earn your attention with a question that is a half a question, half a plea, uh, connected with the gender perspective of the economical and financial crisis that we are living or try to live through. Uh, namely, following uh, for now almost four years, uh, all the debates about financial system collapsed back in 2008 and the recession and economic crisis that followed. Uh, with a cynical joke, I have a remark that uh, very often uh, smart men and women uh, behave like they put the question, who framed us with a crisis? Uh, I don't know the answer, and it's probably rhetorical, but I know very surely that a very few women were there in creating and framing all of us with the uh, uh, economic and financial difficulties throughout the OEC region. And uh, what I uh, uh, can see, uh, not in rhetorical way, but in, not in a cynical way, is that the world that we used to know and love as it used to be before economical and financial uh, difficulties uh, actually and technically collapsed. And what my concern is, will it fall upon a women in OSC region without any women really being in charge of uh, contributing bad decisions that we now have to resolve with austerity measures throughout a lot of countries in OSC region? Why am I, uh, am I so concerned? Because whenever there is austerity and cuts in budget, it starts with women needs, it starts with women being laid off, it starts with budget cuts when maternity leave or scholarships rising, it means girls will not go to school and boys will stay. If uh, we go, who, we, if we look at our budget, who can be fired, then it's a woman rather than a man. And that's, that's the, my question and the plea, half and half. Can we, in parliamentary assembly, no AC parliamentary assembly, at least follow how economic and financial crisis uh, produce and what kind of consequences produce on role of the women in our region, cultural, social, economic, uh, whatever you name it, uh, the, any woman in our region have. How and will it get worse in the years to come and what can we do not to allow to, uh, uh, to the, for, for the women in our region to live uh, worse than it has happened before. Why is this plea? Because I know that it is hard enough to introduce to budgets all the needs that women put as a request. And it's easy once you cut it off the budget not to put it in any budget when the good times finally arrive, which I deeply believe. So it's a question and a plea for Madam Hedy Fry. Thank you. Thank you, Jordana. It's a good idea also for our discussion in Batumi. It can be one of the dimensions of this discussion. I call now Rosa, what you said, your plea. I call Rosa Agnazarova from Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. In Для решения этой проблемы в нашей республике приняли в законодательстве, в законодательстве специальные меры. В избирательном законодательстве сейчас есть 30% представленность женщин, и таким образом мы решили, представленность женщин в парламенте решен. Также у нас представлены женщины в государственных, муниципальных службах, также э, с помощью принятия закона о равных правах и равных возможностей. Э, отмечено в статье представлено не более 70% одного пола. Но стоит проблема о мониторинге этого законодательства. Иной раз, если не соблюдается, мы всегда отмечаем этот закон, э, эту статью этого закона, чтобы соблюдалось. Я хотела бы, ну, сказ хочу сказать, что у нас экс-президент, как вы знаете, была женщина, сейчас председатель Нацбанка женщина, генпрокурор женщина, председатель Верховного Суда, вице-спикеры женщины, вице-премьеры. Короче, я перечислять не буду, у нас представлены женщины во всех ветвях власти. Теперь в качестве образца, я просмотрев таблицу, посмотрев таблицу э, госпожи Фрай, 
Второе положение. Женщины в парламентах стран ОБС и делегации парламентской ассамблеи ОБС хотела бы сказать, чтобы порекомендовать парламентам стран парламентской ассамблеи ОБС при формировании избрания членов делегации парламентской ассамблеи ОБС, чтобы соблюдали гендерную представленность. Мы должны показать сами пример для других всех стран. Спасибо. Thank you very much. And now I uh, ask it's Nora Wallen. Please, Snora, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to thank Heidi Fry for her updates. Goes without saying I support her views. Um, President, gender equality is an old issue, but not an issue we're at all finished discussing and, and working on, and that includes many countries in the OSCE area, including my own country. I only have a brief suggestion, President, and that is that we, in our next meeting, when we're all gathered, end the sad tradition of ensuing mayhem and noise and hordes of people leaving the room the very moment the special representative on gender issues takes the floor. That's not a new thing. I'm new to this, but it all, uh, already seems like an OSCE tradition, and it is not the level of respect we should treat these uh, important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you very much. Heidi, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to first answer Jordana's question, and I think it's very well documented that a fin the financial crisis has a greater impact on women. Women tend to be the ones who have part-time jobs. Women tend to be the ones who are very tenuously attached to the workforce. So as soon as you start laying off, the first persons to be laid off are women. And you know, I, I, I want to remind everyone that it was not so very long ago in many of our countries, including the United States and Canada, where in the 50s, in the public service, if a woman had a job um, and there was a man with a family, she had, couldn't get it because a man with a family needed it more. I think I hope that we've moved beyond that and we've begun to see that given that women make up about 51% of our, all of our countries, how, how important and how stupid is it for us to ignore 51% of our workforce. I don't know of any successful company that would ignore 51% of its workforce, that would not do whatever it can to get 51% of its workforce to be the most productive. And yet, we don't do this in our countries. We still tend to treat women with a pat on the head and a little bit of a flick of the eye and say, there, there, you sweet little thing, let's give you a job. And then, of course, once a man needs it, we will let you go. And I think we we fail to recognize the talent that women bring with them. Women are good at so many things that men are not good at, in the same way that men are good at so many things that women are not good at. And between the two of us, we make up a whole. We complement each other. We bring skills to the table that we each do not have. So we have the best of both worlds, and we have the best productivity and the best ability to make, to make what we can in terms of our employment, and therefore productivity and competitiveness in the world. And that's what it is about in a global economy. So women do suffer in times of financial crisis. And you're right, Jordana, the first thing to get cut has got anything to do with women attached to it. And we have to see to it that you as parliamentarians do not allow that to happen. I think the second thing that we have from uh, my colleague from Kyrgyzstan is that she did talk about the 30%, and there is always a sense that 30% is a magic number, and if we have 30% of any minority group, everything is going to be fine and everything will fall into place. This is why I'm doing the study with Odea, because I think what we want to find out is what does 30% of women in parliament actually mean? How does it really influence the outcomes? Are these women influential, or are they just there so that we can say we have 30% of women there? Are these women given positions within the financial um, policy areas or are they all given the nice, warm, fuzzy playings like social policy and child care and all of those kinds of things? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Are, 
is that 30% making a difference? And that's, in, instead of wondering if it is or not, I think we're going to be doing a real study, and I hope you will participate in the study to find out if it is. And the other question is, and I know that in Canada we do this, women from every single different political party meet occasionally. And it's interesting to note that even though we have a lot of difference within our conservative to liberal to socialist, we, the women, find the ability to have common ground on some things, and together we go to bat to make it happen. And so that's some of the things I think that women do show that they can do differently. They can build consensus and they can work together across barriers to make change. And finally, I think the, the, the question about people getting up and leaving, uh, I think that... Um, we have, therein lies the problem, that we do have people who think if it's about women, it really isn't terribly, terribly important, and why should we listen to it anyway? But that will change, and I think when we see today that the representative, the foreign affairs representative from Ireland was a woman, and that we find that women can and do have a lot to say that is important and interesting, we will see the value of having women participate with us in making our countries better, in helping to make our world better. So thanks very much for your questions. Thank you very much, Hedy. I hope that we'll improve ourselves to the gender issues in our lives, in our parliaments. Thank you very much. Let's go now to our special debate on the future of conventional arms controls in the OEC area. And uh, I have to say that it's a pleasure for me to open this 2012 Winter Meeting Special Debate on the future of conventional arm control in the OEC. And uh, I'm also delighted to welcome our keynote speakers, that is Mr. Adon Mazur, who is the head of the delegation of the Russian Federation to the Vienna Negotiation on Military Security and Arms Control. Thank you, Mr. Mazur, for being with us. The next is Dr. Damian Leader, who is the Chief Arms Control Delegate to the United States Mission to the OECE. Thank you, Mr. Leader, to be with us. And the third is Matthew Gesten, Senior FSC Support Officer, OEC Conflict Prevention Center. Thank you for being with us. Dear friends, dear colleagues, at the 2010 OECE Summit in Astana, Heads of states and governments reconfirmed their OEC commitments, including a vision for a free, democratic, common and indivisible Euro-Atlantic, a Eurasian security community stretching from Vancouver to Vladivostok. And I think it is clear that the common security community requires a functional and modern arms control regime. No matter from which angle you look at this, transparency and predictability of your neighbor's resources and actions are crucial elements of trust and security. In this context, all OECE participating states need to prioritize acting together and set aside domestic political agendas. Arms control has been one of the early success stories which helped break down barriers in Europe, ending the Cold War in, the control, in a controlled way and in prevented new armed races. The CFE Treaty has had a crucial impact on strategic cooperation and military development. We have to speak frankly. The CFE Treaty it removed the Soviet superiority in heavy conventional armaments, eliminating the fears in Western Europe. It helped also divide the stockpile of conventional arms in the Soviet Union among the eight successful states. And it mitigated fears connected with the reunification of Germany by binding Germany to ceilings agreed within NATO. 
All of these contributions to European security were made in a transparent way with a verification mechanism in place. The current stalemate in the CFE regime is detrimental not only when it comes to updating the agreements on arms control per se, but because it hinders government's ability to take important and necessary political decisions. It is time for the signatories to show the necessary flexibility and the gains engage constructively. The OECD's Forum for Security Cooperation has been tasked to update and modernize the Vienna document 2011. The document needs to, proper, to properly reflect present-day aspects, aspects of security and the evolution of armed forces in order to strengthen military stability, transparency and predictability. Small steps in the right directions were taken in 2011, but unfortunately only at the technical level. Much more is required. But regrettably, certain participating states use the old dividing lines and block the progress. As a result, the whole endeavor of modernization of the Vienna document that started a few years ago with so great optimism and served by all fervor in reality is falling short of our previous ambitions. At the same time, even this modest Vienna document 2011 is hindered by problems that arise from the unpreparedness of the legislation of certain states to facilitate the implementation, and this is a fact that only adds to the mutual mistrust and uneasiness. I would like to stress that there is a need for bold political actions from all sides in a spirit that would allow us to go beyond the old ways of thinking, so as to make the Vienna document, document a real instrument for the promotion and consolidation, not only of peace, but of mutual understanding as well. At the same time, besides the problem regarding CFE and the Vienna document, I note that the third pillar of conventional arms control in the OEC area, that is the Open Skies Treaty, and particularly its main instrument, the Consultative Committee, faces certain problems in its function. I hope that positive thinking will prevail and all the problems will be overcome. In this respect, as MPs, as parliamentarians, I think that we have the obligation, the duty, to oversee our governments and hold them accountable for their policy decisions. We have to influence government position in negotiations on disarmament and arms control, to make appropriate decisions on national budget including defence, and enact legislation in line with international commitments in the areas of arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. The future of arms control in Europe must be based on the fundamental OECE principles, which includes any nation's sovereign right to decide whether to join alliance or organizations, the freedom to host foreign military installations based on host nations' consent, as well as reciprocity of commitments. But we have to work hard to give to CFE a very concrete directions, to revive the Vienna document, to implement the open skies, and to secure Europe in both dimensions, Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian, as we are from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Thank you. I'm sure that as parliamentarians we, we will play our important role. And I have the pleasure now to call our first speaker who will introduce our debate, that is Dr. Damien 
leader, Chief Arms Control Delegate to the United States Mission to the OEC. Leader, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for your introduction. I feel that after you've uh, given the remarks you've made that I will only be able to add a little bit on uh, to the direction of what you've said. I think this session is especially important because the United States believes in the indivisibility of security throughout the Euro-Atlantic area and the interdependence of all three OSCE dimensions. Human rights, economic development, and military transparency, along with the OSCE instruments that promote them, are all part of the seamless cloth of comprehensive European security. Arms control, we believe, is a key part of that effort. The United States believes that robust multilateral conventional arms control arrangements and confidence and security building mechanisms, or CSBMs, contribute to a more stable and predictable environment in Europe. We believe that the conventional arms control agreements and CSBMs that were formed in the early 1990s have contributed enormously to the security of Europe. These measures fit within a larger network of security tools, both bilateral and multilateral. They provide a more secure foundation for stability in our strategic relationships, and we are committed to making a serious investment in strengthening the current security architecture. Furthermore, we believe we must continually adapt and strengthen our efforts to meet current and future security needs. I want to stress up front, however, that multilateral arms control regimes cannot and should not be expected to solve all the regional, bilateral, political, and security issues that may be in play between the parties involved. Conventional arms control regimes should, however, take account of existing security relationships and concerns and provide a level of transparency about those relationships, allowing for confidence building at the regional and sub-regional levels and among larger groups of participants. Mr. Chairman, as you outlined, there are really three conventional regimes that play these key roles in European security, the Open Skies Treaty, the Vienna Document, and the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, or CFE. All three regimes contribute to security and stability in their unique ways, but when they are working in harmony, the result is greater stability for all of us. First, let me mention the success of the Open Skies Treaty. Uh, in March this coming month, the treaty will mark an important milestone with the 20th anniversary of its signature at the Helsinki CSCE Summit in 1992. Collectively, the 34 parties to the treaty have conducted over 835 observation flights over each other's territories. States are working hard to improve the regime by transitioning now to digital sensors. We expect the Open Skies Treaty to continue contributing to openness and transparency among, among its members for years to come. <coughs> the second key regime is the Vienna Document, a set of politically binding confidence and security building measures which allow us to share military data and to inspect each other's military facilities. The Vienna Document has also contributed immeasurably to Europe-wide military transparency and reassurance. We also think it's a useful template for other regions outside Europe as they look to build confidence in the military intentions of their neighbors. Since 2010, we have worked to modernize the Vienna document to make it more relevant for 21st century military capabilities and security realities. In December of last year, an updated Vienna document was issued at the Vilnius Ministerial. But it is a living document which needs to be continuously updated. We are now engaged with our partners to further the modernization of the Vienna document with particular attention to expanding the content of information exchanges and increasing efficiency in the conduct of verification activities. Going forward, we have two goals in mind. We want to strengthen existing provisions and at the same time ensure the document remains relevant to today's 21st century security challenges. Let me also make clear that we do not see Vienna document as a substitute for CFE or conventional arms control, but rather as its complement. It provides transparency throughout Europe and, like the Open Skies Treaty, increases confidence by allowing states to see what their neighbors are up to militarily and providing opportunities for militaries to meet on a one-to-one -one and group basis. Vienna document does not limit weapons or troops, but it does make it clear what national intentions are. Unfortunately, our work in 2012 has begun on a negative note, 
with the Russian Federation failing to implement the new Vienna document 2011, and we look forward to its expeditious return to full compliance. In contrast to the Vienna document, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, or CFE, is real arms control that places numerical limits on the quantities and types of weapons. Since its entry into force, more than 72,000 pieces of Cold War military equipment, tanks, armored combat vehicles, artillery, combat aircraft, and attack helicopters have been eliminated. Under CFE, thousands of inspections have taken place at military sites all over Europe, dramatically increasing confidence and military transparency on the continent by providing a means to verify data exchanges. The CFE regime remains important to the United States and for European security as a whole. Unfortunately, the Russian Federation ceased implementation of its CFE obligations in December 2007. After trying for several years to encourage Russia to resume implementation and move past this problem, in November 2011, the United States ceased carrying out certain obligations under the CFE Treaty with regard to Russia. We were joined by our NATO allies that are party to the treaty, as well as Georgia and Moldova, in taking this important step in all 24 of the 30 countries that are party to the treaty. The U.S. and NATO allies made two major efforts since 2007 to find a way forward on CFE-related issues, but this has not proved possible so far. We are ready to return to the negotiating table whenever we have a signal that real progress can be made on the remaining issues, including the right of states to choose whether to allow foreign forces to be stationed on their territories and military transparency among parties essential for preserving confidence during the negotiation. So that's what's happened so far. The question is what happens next? The United States remains committed to conventional arms control, and we are ready to work towards finding a solution to preserve, strengthen, and modernize conventional arms control regime in Europe. Although we are some distance from starting a negotiation, we are now discussing a way forward with all CFE states parties and with other interested countries as well. We are listening to their views and needs and considering what sort of, sort of agreement will provide the confidence and security that we all need while ensuring weapons and troops are at the lowest possible levels. All possibilities are on the table. Whether a new regime will track closely with CFE or with the never implemented adapted CFE Treaty of 1999 or be something quite different. Questions to be resolved include limitations and just what needs to be limited since the equipment categories in CFE re reflect a military reality that is quite different from that of today. The nature of such a regime also needs to be determined, whether it will be legally binding, politically binding, or a mixture of both. The area of application needs to be agreed, including what to do about the existing so-called black holes in CFE, the conflict zones where forces can be hidden. Whether there is a role for sub-regional agreements to complement the treaty also needs to be considered. In short, the United States has more questions than answers, but that's really the nature of multilateral agreements. Conventional arms control is not, like with the New START nuclear treaty, a bilateral agreement to be worked out between the U.S. and the Russian Federation. Instead, it must take into consideration the security needs and concerns of 30 or more states in very different neighborhoods, ranging from the Arctic Circle to the borders of Iran. But the conversation has begun and the parameters are being staked out, and your countries will all have a role to play as the process unfolds. Thank you very much, and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Damian Leader, and now I go to Ando Mazur, the head of the delegation of the Russian Federation to the Vienna Negotiation on Military Security and Arms Control. Mr. Mazur, you have the floor. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Господин председатель, темой нашего сегодняшнего обсуждения заявлено будущее контроля над обычными вооружениями в регионе ОБСЕ. Однако, наверное, рассмотреть контуры будущего невозможно, не обратившись к прошлому и не усвоив его уроки. Поскольку, наверное, большинство собравшихся в этом зале не сталкивается на повседневной основе с проблемой контроля над обычными вооружениями, наверное, необходим краткий исторический экскурс. 
Я сосредоточусь прежде всего на вопросах, связанных с договором об обычных вооруженных силах в Европе. И в конце кратко затрону проблематику венского документа и открытого неба. Разумеется, я хотел бы предложить вам взгляд на проблему с российской точки зрения. И заранее прошу прощения у своего друга и коллеги Демиана Лидера, что, наверное, не совсем он будет согласен. Заключенный в 1990 году договор об обычных вооруженных силах в Европе являлся достаточно действенным и эффективным для своего времени инструментом укрепления европейской безопасности. Он подвел черту под эпохой межблокового противостояния, установил равновесие сил двух союзов на пониженных уровнях и позволил осуществлять военное планирование и строительство, исходя не из наихудшего сценария, а из реальных тенденций развития обстановки. Однако затем, с прекращением существования Варшавского договора, а затем и Советского Союза, с выводом советских, а позднее российских войск из Центральной и Восточной Европы, стран Балтии, Республика СНГ, с возникновением ряда очагов конфликтов и особенно с расширением НАТО, договорные механизмы, предназначенные для поддержания баланса сил между двумя военно-политическими союзами, стали утрачивать эффективность. Признав этот факт, государства-участники договора разработали и подписали в 1999 году соглашение об адаптации до все, призванное повысить в новых условиях предсказуемость и стабильность Европе. Режим адаптированного до все был ориентирован на укрепление безопасности каждого государства-участника, независимо от его принадлежности к военно-политическим союзам. К сожалению, практически сразу же после подписания соглашения об адаптации до все страны НАТО, как мы полагаем, под воздействием США, взяли курс на затягивание процесса введения этого документа в действие. Начало ратификации соглашения они стали увязывать с выполнением России различных надуманных условий. С 2002 года Таким условием являлось выполнение не относящихся к договору элементов ее двусторонних договоренностей с Грузией и Молдавией о выводе российских войск с их территорий. На Западе они известны как «Стамбульские обязательства». Commitments. Причем требования наших партнеров все множились и множились. Россия же, выполнив все относящиеся к все договоренности, считала эту увязку неправомерной. Откровенно говоря, мы исходили из того, что Соединенные Штаты и некоторые их союзники стремились использовать контроль над вооружениями исключительно как средство продвижения своих геополитических интересов и в то же время сохранить себе свободу рук на случай массированной передислокации сил для проведения операций, подобных иракской. Исключительные обстоятельства, сложившиеся вокруг договора, побудили Россию поставить вопрос о приостановлении действия договора. На чрезвычайной конференции государств-участников ДОВСЕ, которая прошла здесь, в Вене, в июне 2007 года, Российская Федерация обозначила условия, которые она считала необходимыми для восстановления жизнеспособности режима договора. Давай отбелите обе трети. Это возвращение в Латвии, Литвы и Эстонии в договорное поле и тем самым ликвидация одной из тех черных дыр, о которых говорил э, мой коллега Демиан. Это компенсация дисбалансов в обычных вооружениях, возникших в результате двух волн расширения НАТО. Это принятие политического решения об отмене дискриминационных и препятствующих борьбе с терроризмом фланговых подуровней для территории России. Это разработка общего понимания обязательства об отказе от дополнительного постоянного размещения существенных боевых сил, которое было зафиксировано в основополагающем Additional 
permanent de uh, uh, deployment of uh, substantial combat forces. As it was set forth in the uh, Russian NATO Founding Act. Это вступление в силу или, по крайней мере, начало временного применения соглашения об адаптации. И это, наконец, разработка условий присоединения к до все новых участников и дальнейшая модернизация договора. Однако страны Альянса проигнорировали российские предложения по выводу до всей из кризиса, ограничившись обещаниями обсудить их позже, после вступления адаптированного договора в силу. С учетом этого, 12 декабря 2007 года была приостановлена вся деятельность России по выполнению договора и связанных с ним документов. В частности, были прекращены предоставление информации, прием и проведение инспекций. Россия в период приостановления не связана ограничениями, в том числе и фланговыми, на количество обычных вооружений. При этом отмечалось, что планов массированного наращивания вооружений или концентрации их на границах с соседями в существовавшей тогда обстановке не имелось. В дальнейшем же реальные количества и размещение вооружений и техники должны были зависеть от конкретной военно-политической ситуации, в том числе от готовности наших партнеров проявлять сдержанность. В то же время, проявляя добрую волю и учитывая пожелания государств участников договора, Россия продолжила участие в работе совместной конститутивной группы. Следует также отметить что мы лишь приостановили действие договора и тем самым дали всем государствам-участникам шанс сохранить режим контроля над обычными вооружениями в Европе. Приостановление – это не самоцель, а средство борьбы России за будущее этого режима, разумной альтернативы которому мы не видим. После приостановления были продолжены консультации с западными партнерами по восстановлению жизнеспособности этого режима. Основная практическая работа велась в российско-американском формате. Страны НАТО в качестве отправной точки для диалога с Россией выдвинули концепцию параллельных действий, которую лучше было бы назвать Parallel Action Plan, которую лучше было бы назвать действия России в обмен на обещания партнеров. In exchange for its partners promises. Конкретно некоторые члены Альянса собирались приступить к ратификации соглашения об адаптации, а от России ожидалось принятие определенных мер в отношении своего военного присутствия в Приднестровье и на военной базе в Гудауте в Грузии. Отмечая несбалансированность данной концепции, российская сторона, тем не менее, не отказывалась от рассмотрения данного документа и продолжала работу с партнерами по конкретному наполнению пакета. К сожалению, Запад по-прежнему оказался не готов учесть некоторые наши ключевые озабоченности, например, отменить фланговые ограничения применительно к территории России. По другим проблемам выражалась лишь готовность обсудить наши озабоченности после вступления в силу адаптированного до все. К нам же выдвигалось требование об отмене приостановления до все сразу после согласования пакетного решения. Консультации шли непросто. Наши партнеры вели их по формуле «шаг вперед, два шага назад». Порой они брали продолжительные паузы, и у нас возникали сомнения относительно их реальной заинтересованности в достижении положительного результата. Лишь с объявлением новым президентом США Бараком Обамой курса на перезагрузку отношений с Россией эта тема постепенно стала выходить из тени. В мае 2009 года Россия детально изложила партнерам наши подходы к пакетному решению проблемы ДОВСИ. В частности, нами отмечалась необходимость обеспечить сбалансированный характер проекта этого решения, который должен был предусматривать встречные действия заинтересованных сторон. 
Все аспекты, способные вызвать разногласия, должны были быть урегулированы непосредственно в рамках пакета, причем таким образом, который исключал бы возможность различных интерпретаций и срыва достигнутых договоренностей. В 2010 году обозначилась активизация переговорного процесса, и в период с июня 2010 по май 2011 года был проведен ряд двусторонних российско-американских и неофициальных многосторонних встреч государств-участников договора и стран НАТО, заявивших о намерении присоединиться к этому режиму. В ходе встреч обсуждались рамки будущих переговоров по укреплению и модернизации этого режима. Российская сторона, надо сказать, пошла навстречу своим партнерам и внесла, внесла целый ряд компромиссных предложений, направленных на достижение взаимоприемлемого решения и открывших возможность согласования рамок. В частности, мы не настаивали на том, чтобы, скажем, такой важный для нас вопрос, как устранение фланговых ограничений, решался до начала переговоров. Однако некоторые участники консультации, в отличие от России, выдвинули предварительные условия для начала переговоров по существу и, убедившись в невозможности добиться выполнения своих запросных требований, вновь взяли паузу в многостороннем диалоге. В сентябре прошлого года в Вене состоялась очередная четвертая конференция по рассмотрению действия ДОВСЕ. Она прошла спокойно в неконфронтационном ключе, но по ее итогам не удалось принять никаких документов. В ноябре прошлого года, как уже сказал Демиан, страны НАТО объявили в совместной консультативной группе о приостановке представления России информации по договору и приема российских инспекций на своей территории. Надо сказать, что Россия спокойно прореагировала на это решение, поскольку мы с самого начала, приостанавливая действия до все, исходили из того, что соответствующее решение за нашими партнерами. Никогда не настаивали на том, чтобы они продолжали давать нам информацию или принимать инспекции. В свою очередь, российская сторона не стала более передавать партнерам краткую обобщенную информацию о своих вооружениях и технике, которую она в порядке доброй воли раньше представляла остальным государствам-участникам ДОВСЕ после приостановления действия договора. Таково положение дел на сегодня. Консультации по, рамках, по рамкам новых переговоров оказались в тупике. Главная причина, на наш взгляд, состоит в том, что некоторые страны пытаются использовать интерес партнеров к восстановлению жизнеспособности этого инструмента безопасности для решения политических проблем, далеких от сферы разоружения. Такой подход, игнорирующий новые политические реалии в Европе, делает невозможным согласование надежной основы для запуска переговоров. А без этого режим контроля над обычными вооружениями окончательно деградирует. Фактор неопределенности в этой сфере отрицательно скажется на безопасности в Европе, будет подпитывать недоверие и подстегивать настроение в пользу односторонних, а не коллективных подходов. И вместе с тем история до все свидетельствует, что любые вопросы, даже самые трудные, находили свое решение тогда, когда превалировала заинтересованность в формировании надежной системы безопасности средствами контроля над вооружениями. И напротив, крах до все был вызван попытками привнести в него материю, политические вопросы, конфликтную проблематику. Остается надеяться, что рано или поздно наши партнеры поймут, что такие попытки не имеют перспективы, откажутся от предварительных условий, неоправданных пауз и контрпродуктивных увязок. Как мы понимаем, многие наши партнеры используют паузу в консультациях для обдумывания вопроса о том, каким мог бы быть будущий режим, к чему следует стремиться. Такая работа идет и в Москве. Разумеется, детальная проработка подходов потребует определенного времени. 
Но уже сейчас можно сказать, что просто залатать прорехи нынешнего и даже адаптированного до все уже едва ли возможно. Жизнь уходит вперед все дальше. Поэтому мы выступаем за глубокую модернизацию режима контроля над обычными вооружениями в Европе. Какими нам видятся возможные новые договоренности и соглашения в области контроля над обычными вооружениями в Европе? Представляется, что они должны отражать баланс интересов участников и отвечать современным реалиям в Европе. Жизненно важно, чтобы они исключали преобладающее военное превосходство одной стороны и навязывание ограничений по дислокации вооружений и военной техники в пределах национальной территории. Необходимо обратить внимание и на экономическую сторону вопроса, сделав так, чтобы новый режим вносил реальный вклад в предотвращение затратной гонки вооружений и устанавливал инспекционный режим, минимально необходимый для надежной проверки соблюдения количественных ограничений на вооружение. Мы рассчитываем, что и наши партнеры в скором будущем смогут поделиться с нами своими идеями. Ведь найти приемлемое для всех решение можно только совместными усилиями. И буквально несколько слов, я понимаю, что я вышел за рамки регламента, но буквально несколько слов по венскому документу и по договору по открытому небу. По венскому документу нам удалось в прошлом году наконец преодолеть 12-летний застой в его развитии и согласовать несколько, может быть, не очень крупных, но важных с практической точки зрения усовершенствований венский документ. В принципе, мы с точки зрения содержания этого нового документа, венского документа 2011 года, у Российской Федерации нет проблем. Возникли небольшие сложности, связанные с тем, что этот документ получил новое имя, и поэтому с точки зрения юридической, с точки зрения финансовой, нам необходимо оформить это дело с точки зрения, как, как э, через принятие внутренних нормативных актов. Я думаю, что мы в скором будущем решим эту проблему. Как дальше пойдет работа над модернизацией венского документа, сейчас трудно сказать. Наверное, она приобретет эволюционный характер. Это объективная вещь, потому что мы пока исчерпали весь запас не оспариваемых никем предложений, которые лежали на столе, консенсусных предложений. То, что лежит на столе сейчас, пока, пока не пользуется консенсусом. Хотя бы у одной и двух делегаций, но есть проблемы с теми предложениями, которые сейчас обсуждаются. Кроме того, очевидно, приходится учитывать и то, что мы находимся в фазе финансового кризиса многие из нас, поэтому дополнительные расходы на транспарентность, видимо, не для всех приемлемы. Некоторые из наших стран находятся в середине военной реформы, и тоже еще надо посмотреть, как она скажется на возможности дальнейшей транспарентности. Одним словом, здесь еще потребуется время на размышления, и, видимо, работа будет не такой скорой, но мы надеемся, что все-таки она будет результативной. Что касается открытого неба, то выполнение договора в целом идет успешно. У нас есть некоторые политические проблемы в работе органа, который занимается вопросами выполнения договора по открытому небу, консультативной комиссии по открытому небу. Но я надеюсь, что также в ближайшее время эти проблемы будут преодолены. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Еще раз прошу прощения, что я слишком говорю. Спасибо. Matthew Gistin, the senior FSC support officer to OEC Conflict Prevention Center.
Mr. Gessling, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to address this distinguished audience. As you already have noticed in the first two presentations on this subject, the future of arms control in the OSCE area is of our particular interest and can and should be approached in our discussions from different angles and at different levels. And although the subject is not only comprehensive and interlinked, also our briefings are interlinked and comprehensive, so my apology for possible duplications in my presentation. I would like to focus on the discussion in the work of the OSCE's Forum for Security Cooperation in the first dimension, focusing on the confidence and security building measures which constitute an integral and indispensable part of the OSCE framework for arms control. Throughout the last decades, OSCE participating states have been involved in the security dialogue addressing various aspects of European security. And since the beginning of the CSE OSCE, all efforts to conclude disarmament and arms control agreements have been based for a great part on the guiding principles and common values incorporated in the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, like, for instance, the obligation of states to refrain from threat or use of force in their relations, and the territorial integrity of states and others. In order to implement these principles, participating states agreed to fulfill this duty in every way they would deem appropriate. And this was the start of the development of actual confidence and security building measures. When these measures first were introduced, they were revolutionary in nature. And with the adoption of the Madrid mandate for the CSBMs in 1983, the first generation of CSBMs received a boost by upgrading their status from voluntary to political binding, defining the application zone, and by providing the right to any participating states to verify information which was received in the mutual info exchanges. The notion of the development of transparency has been confirmed and strengthened in the Stockholm document in 1986, leading to the adoption of the Vienna document in 1999, which was further developed in 92. 94 and 1999. And as we all know, the Vienna document includes a wide variety of different tailor-made instruments aiming at building confidence and security in the military field. It regulates a number of areas, including the information exchange and other transparency measures, including verification and mechanisms for consulting, military context, and finally also military cooperation. However, since the end of the Cold War, the strategic security environment and nature of conflicts in the OSC area have changed. The Vienna document measures were developed with inter rather than intrastate conflict in mind. In other words, maybe our document is not well suited to be applied in the conflicts and security threats of the OSC, which we have to deal with since then. The changed nature of the conflicts and threats to stability and security in the OSC area led to the review of the existing politic, uh, polit uh, policy and military toolkit with the following questions in the background. What are the current threats faced by OSC participating states? And what are the key differences in existing security perceptions? Can they be overcome through arms control and CSBMs only? And if yes, what kind of arms control and CSBM arrangements would be needed to address these threats and possible misperceptions? How could the existing measures and be updated further? Do we need new measures to complement and or expand our current framework? And what kind of mechanisms are needed to make full use of the available CSBM tools in addressing protected and recent conflicts? Now, no matter what the answers to these questions are, the participating states would benefit from an adapted or new set of CSBMs to be more flexible and tailor-made for applications in different parts of the OEC region, including with conflict situations, to strengthen transparency and military predictability. Also at the strategic level, the Vienna document, being one of the main tools for early warning and confidence building, needs to be modernized to become this living document which can provide sufficient level of transparency and predictability on the development of the armed forces and their activities in our regions. The Athens Ministerial in 2009 
called on the FSC to, as it was called, explore ways in which to strengthen the OSCE political military toolbox with particular attention to strengthen current arms control and CSBM's instruments, including the Vienna Document 99. Consequently, the FSC engaged in a constructive dialogue and adopted a decision which established a procedure for an update of the Vienna document every five years. This decision became the most political and substantially important improvement, marking the end of a long standstill period of the Vienna document negotiations. It provides a clear procedural framework for regular modernizations of this key document. During the Astana summit, the need to revitalize, update, and modernize the confidence and security building measures was recognized by the head of states and government, and they called on the FSC to work to that end. And throughout 2010 and 11, the FSC engaged in very active discussions on various proposals to update the document, resulting in nine Vienna document plus decisions, and all those decisions were incorporated in our new Vienna document 2011, which was issued in November 2011. In addition, more proposals are on the table in the Forum for Security Cooperation at this moment. They pertain to military transparency, to risk reductions, to prior notifications of military activities and verification measures, as mentioned in chapters 1, 3, 5, and 9. Thorough consideration and eventually consensus on these proposals would bring us the qualitatively different level of effectiveness of CSBMs. With this in mind, the most recent Vilnius Ministerial Council meeting called to give further impetus to the negotiations on updating and modernizing this document with the aim of increasing military stability, transparency and predictability for all participating states. However, the success of the negotiations on these proposals largely depends on the political will of states to have more security for less means through constraints and transparency on military activities and their readiness to use the momentum that was created in Corfu and Astana to make further substantial progress under the Vienna document, even though the developments, or maybe the rather non-actions, as you have heard, within other arms control issues and regional conflicts are still lacking behind. Let me conclude this short presentation by stating that on our level of working with CSBMs, we, the CPC and Secretariat, are willing and stand ready to support the participating states to bring the experiences of the OSCE into focus and highlight particular areas where CSBMs may be of interest for further discussions and or action in the framework of conventional arms control in our area in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> So, dear colleague, uh, colleagues, I decided that I withdraw myself out from the agenda that we just adopted. I will not be making any concluding remarks in order to facilitate the debate with the colleagues. I have 17 colleagues in the list. Uh, please, if we work with a limit of two minutes, all of them, they can speak. If not, we have to stop because there is also the proposal by our colleagues, the delegation from France about Syria, the killings of the two journalists, that the statement that I have to propose at the end of our session. So please, can you accept the two minutes time limit? Thank you. So we start with George Letelli from Georgia. And to be prepared, Ika Kanerva from Finland, the next. Great. So thank you. We have also another speaker from our delegation. So can we ask for three minutes then, instead of two, two? So, um, so it's very evident that situation when uh, one CFE state party refused to comply with its international legal obligations, while others continued implementation of the treaty, it could not last indefinitely. Bearing in mind they mentioned, Georgia's vast majority of the state's party decided to cease performing its obligations under the treaty vis-a-vis -vis Russian Federation. 
continuing negligence by the Russian Federation to observe its internationally undertaken obligations under the CFE Treaty directly affects effectiveness of the regime once preserved as a cornerstone of European security. Georgia will continue implementation of the CFE Treaty vis-à-vis -vis all states party other than Russia. An existence of the CFE regime failed to considerably contribute Georgia's security. You all know about that. Moreover, we believe that possibilities of any new regime, similar to the later, to serve as an effective instrument against a possible Russian aggression, would be quite limited, given Moscow's traditional reluctance for international agreements and norms of international law. Nevertheless, Georgia stands committed to actively participate in possible future efforts aimed at revitalization of effective European conventional arms control, especially taking into consideration concerns of our partners. Here it should be stressed that we have our well-known red lines and our utmost interest in the process in that any final document clearly and univocally states the principle of host nation consent and avoids any formulation that could leave room for ambiguities or multiply interpretations in respect to Georgia's territorial integrity. Thank you. You are wonderful. What do, what do I have to say? Thank you very much. We go now to our colleague Ika Kanerva from the Finland and uh, is next is Bahar Buratova from Azerbaijan. Ika, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. So, more than one year ago, in heads, uh, the heads of the state of our organization formulated very clear guidelines for the f future work on arms control. One of the main points was that efforts in the area of conventional arms control, the confidence building measures, have to be revitalized, updated and modernized. Efforts in this area have continued. The first steps to modernize the Vienna document have been taken and some modest progress have recorded at the end of the last year. However, the updates that, uh, updates, uh, that uh, we agreed upon have indeed quite modest and largely of technical nature. The real modernization of the Vienna document is still ahead. The key points were negotiated at the time of the end of the Cold War, and the document thus reflected quite different military circumstances that we have today. We parliamentarians have followed the efforts to start new arms control negotiations. Unfortunately, as we all know, the negotiations of this agreement were not restarted last year as we agreed in Astana summit in December 2010. This needs to be reconsidered in the OSCE framework. We really need to be seriously concerned uh, if the future of arm control in the OSCE area is at risk. I would like to conclude by raising three specific points. One is that we need to launch, we need to restart the genuine discussion in the OSCE on the future of arms control. Secondly, we need to take a fresh look at the needs of today. Uh, and thirdly, and lastly, the time is crucial thing, really, Mr. President, and therefore all these involved, all of us, need step up effort to follow up the decision taken at the Astana summit. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, dear colleague. We go now to Bahatova from Azerbaijan. It is Christopher Smith, the next one from the United States. Bahar, you have. Господин председатель, я выражаю огромную признательность уважаемым спикерам за их выступление. Уважаемые коллеги, мы преследуем цель обеспечения того, чтобы меры по контролю над вооружениями соответствовали нормам и принципам международного права, закрепленным в уставе ООН и Хельсинским заключительном акте, и способствовали повышению безопасности и стабильности в регионе ОБСЕ. 
Наш подход к режимам по контролю над обычными вооруженными силами в зоне ОБСЕ, как до все и венский документ 2011 года, всегда базировался на необходимости их строгого выполнения во всех географических регионах, включая область применения. Венский документ должен способствовать взаимному доверию и развеять озабоченность по поводу военных действий путем поощрения открытости и транспарентности, взаимное доверие, стабильность, транспарентность и проверяемость являются надежными основными принципами, которыми следует руководствоваться в области контроля над вооружениями и в процессе МДБ. Очевидно, что режим ДОФСЕ серьезно ослаблен из-за нарушения основных принципов этого договора. Следует отметить, что с самого начала самое главное обязательство государств, участников ДОФСЕ и других режимов по контролю над обычными вооруженными силами воздерживаться и в их взаимных, как и вообще в их международных отношениях от применения силы или угрозы силой как против территориальной целостности или политической независимости любого государства, так и каким-либо другим образом, несовместимым с целями и принципами Устава ООН, постоянно сознательно нарушалось на протяжении всего периода после вступления этих договоров в силу. Мы также сталкиваемся с очевидным несоблюдением одного из основных принципов до все принципа согласия принимающего государства. Статья 4.5 договора гласит, что ни одно государство участник не размещает обычные вооруженные силы на территории другого государства участника без согласия этого государства участника. Все эти проблемы являются наиболее серьезными факторами, подрывающими безопасность. Эти проблемы нуждаются в дальнейшем последовательном рассмотрении с целью обеспечения эффективности и целостности режимов по контролю над обычными вооруженными силами. Мы считаем, что любой новый или адаптированный документ и договоренность, которые игнорируют эту ситуацию, не могут рассчитывать на успех. Спасибо за большое внимание и за терпение. My colleagues, there are few real tools available to compel compliance with the Vienna document or the CFE. If a state party decides and denies inspectors access pursuant to the provisions of those documents, we've got to ask the question, why? If these valuable arms control accords are allowed to deteriorate due to inadequate compliance, the consequences include the risk of conflict and war. Surely nobody wants that. At the core of the CFE and the Vienna document are the demands of robust transparency. No deception, no bad faith, just transparency. Transparency, as we all know, is at the core and was a core principle of the Helsinki Final Act. Light has always been a powerful disinfectant. I would submit respectfully that any diminution of transparency not only leads to suspicion and mistrust, but increases the prospects of war, whether by design or by miscalculation. And there are parallel problems, and I say this to our Russian friends. In Vilnius, there was no agreement on any of the human dimension provisions, including the safety of journalists. So again, we see applied to one of the baskets, the human dimension basket, what we're seeing now applied to arms control. I would like to ask, and I listen very carefully to Mr. Mazes, why Russia refuses to implement existing legally binding arms control agreements. Why not share information? Welcome the inspectors, all while considering and considerations are underway to craft a 21st century updated CFE that includes limitations on what Mr. Leader points out, what needs to be limited. Obviously, there are new weapons that need to be limited. They weren't around when the original CFE was put together. I would also ask Mr. Mazar to elaborate exactly what he means by compensating for NATO enlargement. Thank you, Mr. President. Christopher, it's now Viktor Gumiski from the Belarus and to be con Next, it's Puyu Hasoti from Romania. Victor. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, трудно переоценить роль договора об обычных вооруженных силах в Европе.
Договор заложил основы эффективной системы мер контроля, которая позволила выйти на совершенно новый уровень доверия между европейскими государствами. Масштабные изменения на европейском континенте побудили государства начать адаптацию договора к новым геополитическим реалиям. Соглашение об адаптации ДАВСЕ, подписанное в Стамбуле в 1999 году, открывало четкие перспективы действия договора на многие годы вперед и создавало необходимые условия для обеспечения более высокого уровня безопасности и стабильности в Европе. Осознавая важность и значимость этого документа, для укрепления общей европейской безопасности Беларусь первой ратифицировала адаптированный договор. Мы полагали, что остальные государства последуют нашему примеру. К сожалению, разногласия между государствами привели к тому, что европейский режим контроля над вооружениями более 10 лет находится в кризисном состоянии. В то же время... До все 1990 года остается единственным юридически обязывающим документом в области контроля над вооружениями общеевропейского масштаба. Альтернативы ему нет до сих пор. Политические обязательства не могут заменить собой юридически обязывающего документа. Уважаемые коллеги, перспективы многостороннего режима контроля над обычными вооружениями зависят от политической воли и коллективных усилий всех стран региона ОБСЕ. Нам необходим предметный диалог по поиску консенсуса для восстановления жизнеспособности режима контроля над вооружениями, который должен охватить все страны континента и стать подлинно общеевропейскими. В заключение хотел бы призвать некоторых наших европейских партнеров приложить целенаправленные усилия для решения данного серьезнейшего вопроса в целях нашей общей безопасности, вместо того, чтобы вводить абсурдное эмбарго на спортивные патроны для белорусских биатлонистов. Благодарю за внимание. It's now Puyu Hasoti from Romania to be followed by François Xavier de Donat from Belgium. Puyu, you Thank have you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished colleagues, Romania highly values the strategic importance of the CFE regime and its fundamental principles. This regime, along with the Vienna document 1999, and the Treaty on Open Skies constitute the core of our common approach to security in the field of arms control and confidence building in the OSC area. The fact that at present there is no major conventional military threat on the European continent is a proof that the CFE Treaty has been and still is, in spite of the current conditions, a successful instrument for achieving the major objectives set for more than 20 years ago. We also believe that the engagement of the Russian Federation is key for the treaty to be fully effective to the benefit of confidence and transparency in the field of conventional arms in Europe and the OSCE area. Romania remains committed to conventional arms control in Europe and is prepared to work with all other state parties to find a mutually acceptable principle-based solution on the way forward. We remain committed to preserve, strengthen and modernize conventional arms control in Europe and we are ready to return to negotiations having in mind that all state parties should be prepared to address all key principles that must be part of any negotiation, including the host nation consent for the stationing of uh, foreign forces. Only by taking into account the security interest of all state parties, we can meaningfully contribute to our ultimate aim of strengthening security within the OSCE area. Thank you, President. Very much. You were exactly on time. Now we go to François Xavier de Donéa to be followed by David Tillerson from Canada. François. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Il est émi évidemment éminemment regrettable que l'application et les discussions sur la révision du traité CFE soient au point mort, que la mise en œuvre du traité Open Sky soit en panne, que la mise en œuvre du document de Vienne soit bloquée. Éminemment regrettable parce que l'application et aussi la mise à jour de ces traités et accords est, sont essentiels pour euh, continuer à établir, conforter et renforcer la confiance entre des partenaires OSCE dont les relations sont beaucoup trop souvent encore caractérisées par de la méfiance. Et cette méfiance entre partenaires irrités, malheureusement, de la guerre froide, se justifie d'autant moins que nous sommes tous confrontés aux mêmes euh, menaces euh, nouvelles. Nous avons discuté hier des menaces transnationales. Nous sommes tous confrontés à ces menaces transnationales et ce n'est évidemment pas avec des chars et des hobitsers que l'on va les combattre. Il est donc essentiel que nous améliorions la confiance entre nous en améliorant la transparence des systèmes euh, militaires que nous possédons. Euh, je crois que euh, l'application des traités doit continuer, même pendant que l'on en euh, étudie la modification en profondeur. Je pense aussi que la responsabilité du blocage ne peut être attribuée à un partenaire. Lorsqu'il y a une bagarre dans un couple, c'est en général parce qu'il y a des torts partagés. Et je pense que tant l'OTAN, tant les partenaires de l'OTAN, que la Russie doivent faire un mea culpa et se demander quelles sont les erreurs qu'elles ont commises ces derniers temps, provoquant et entraînant les blocages. Et enfin, Monsieur le Président, je crois que nous devons tout mettre en œuvre pour mettre nos gouvernements sous pression pour qu'ils mettent fin au blocage du traité sur les forces conventionnelles en Europe, sur le traité Open Sky et euh, également au blocage du document de Vienne. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, dear colleague. Uh, dear colleagues, I have to stop here and give uh, one minute to our colleague D'Amigo from Italy for a point of order. He came here to ask me time to raise an issue of point of order. Yes, you have a minute, Claudio. One minute. Grazie Presidente, mi scuso con i colleghi ma penso che questo sia un tema importante, ho cercato prima di prendere la parola quando era stato proposto eh, di limitare a due minuti il tempo dei nostri interventi e ora ho la parola proprio su questo punto. Signor Presidente, questa è un'assemblea parlamentare composta da, sulla carta, più di 300 deputati. Noi dobbiamo dare, dobbiamo permettere ai parlamentari presenti in questa assemblea di intervenire e svolgere dei concetti su dei temi importantissimi con il tempo di cui hanno necessità per svolgere un concetto. L'articolo 27 prevede che di norma siano 5 minuti i tempi per gli interventi. È vero che prevede anche che il Presidente li possa limitare, però è una limitazione che deve avvenire in qualche caso. Ormai sistematicamente i tempi vengono sempre limitati, al massimo a 3 minuti se non a 2 minuti. E in questa Assemblea in tutti i casi è stato sempre così. Lo spazio per il dibattito lasciato a a disposizione dei parlamentari e quindi dei componenti di questa assemblea è sempre stato limitato in una mezz'oretta e in mezz'ora si può parlare quasi per niente e i cinque minuti non vengono mai rispettati. Quindi io invito la Presidenza a fare un ragionamento serio su questo, a prevedere nella previsione degli ordini del giorno più tempo per il dibattito, perché se no non organizziamo più delle assemblee parlamentari, organizziamo dei convegni dove ci sono dei relatori che parlano e basta, perché se non diamo la possibilità ai parlamentari di fare il proprio lavoro e quindi di esprimere le proprie idee, allora l'Assemblea parlamentare non ha più senso. Grazie. Yes, Claudio, but uh, it was until September in which not only its delegation, but its member could raise any issue considering the rules of procedure. It was an open issue. I don't remember your contribution to this. So, and I have to repeat, it is open to have again a new committee for our rules of procedures, but to remember and to have in mind when it is possible to contribute and when we are obliged to obey what we have decided all together. And of course, it's not only the general debates in the sessions, are the committees, And I really believe 
that if it is to change the rules, we have to work all together and to know what we are voting for. Because this limit of the paragraph 7 of 27th article, it was approved just some months ago. So, Claudio, I'm with you when we are all together in what we are doing. Thank you very much. And it is open to reopen the Rules of Procedure Committee. We go now to our colleague David Tilson from Canada, and uh, the only that I can accept is that we can put a limit of five minutes and to stop to each colleague, it's at 4.30. I do not agree. I prefer to have all the colleagues the right to speak and to address the Assembly. Thank you. So, David, you have the floor. David thank Tilson. you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important debate. Arms control is a never-ending process. The circumstances under which any agreement or negotiations are undertaken are ever-changing. As a result, arms control requires our constant vigilance in order to be relevant and effective. Canada remains committed to the conventional forces in Europe regime and the transparency and predictability that it offers. Its role in maintaining confidence and security in Euro-Atlantic area is without any doubt. Given the impasse in our talks on this regime, the renewed efforts of all stakeholders are needed, including we as parliamentarians, which must be redoubled to revitalize the process and find a diplomatic solution to the impasse. By no means are these documents the final say on arms control in the OSCE region. I encourage us all to commit ourselves to the effort required and ensure that current conventional armed control structures are modernized and that the new ones are developed for the future benefit of stability in the region. Canada, for instance, is negotiating a legally binding strategic partnership agreement with the European Union, which hopefully will enable us to act together to protect to project our shared values to third countries on key issues such as international peace and security, non-proliferation, democracy and rule of law. In conclusion, Mr. President, I would like to emphasize that arms control is not without its challenges. For the benefits for regional stability make it necessary and merit our support and encouragement to our governments. Thank you for your attention, Mr. President. For all been so accurate in time. We go to Villa Aleknaita Abramikini from Lithuania to be followed by Ram Safarian from Armenia. Villa, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable speakers, dear colleagues, let me remind the history as well. During the Istanbul summit, Lithuania expressed its readiness to join and ratify the adopted CFE treaty after its entry into force. As you may know, states can only join the treaty when it enters into force. The adopted CFE treaty has never entered into force, while only four countries ratified it to this date. I also would like to point out that in 2001, Lithuania and Russia concluded an agreement on bilateral CSBMs with the aim to exchange CFE treaty type information. This agreement was very well implemented until the end of 2007 when Russia has stopped providing with such information. This agreement with Russia, if implemented, still has a potential to contribute to more military transparency in our region. I happen to hear that conventional arms control should not be linked with protracted conflicts and Istanbul commitments. This is what I want to say. The CFE treaty must have come into force on July 2008. However, instead of that, we witnessed the 2008 summer war. This coincidence speaks for itself. It shows that a delay in assuming and fulfilling the obligations under the CFE treaty 
and threat of new conflicts are inevitably linked. As we know, the process of the modernization of CFE treaty was frozen mainly due to disagreement on host nation consent and transparency measures. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Vilja. And now it's Saram Safarian to be followed by Nazarova. Спасибо, господин председатель. Армения придает особое значение режиму контроля над обычными вооружениями в Европе. Мы были воодушевлены довольно многообещающим началом переговоров по модернизации договора об обычных вооруженных силах в Европе. Несмотря на нынешнюю ситуацию, в которой оказался ДОВСЕ, а также неопределенность относительно рамок будущих переговоров, Армения продолжает выступать за полную реализацию всех положений этого юридически обязывающего договора. Мы убеждены в жизненной необходимости сохранения ДОВСЕ и надеемся, что в обозримом будущем основные разногласия будут преодолены, открыв путь для возобновления переговоров по укреплению и модернизации режима контроля над обычными вооружениями в Европе. Мы подходим к данной проблеме с точки зрения региональных перспектив и рассматриваем жизнеспособный механизм контроля над вооружениями в качестве элемента нашей стратегии безопасности. В нашем регионе сложилась ситуация, когда положения этого ключевого соглашения игнорируются. Одна сторона, будучи участником договора и проходящих под эгидой ОБСЕ соответствующих политических процессов, на протяжении последних пяти лет, согласно официальным данным в нарушении условий ДОВСЕ, превышает свои национальные предельные уровни наличие вооружений и военной техники по крайней мере по трем категориям. Положительную роль в вопросе соблюдения обязательств по ДОВСЕ может сыграть усиление демократии демократического контроля над армией со стороны общественности. В этом вопросе важный вклад могут внести парламентарии, гарантировав транспарентность и исполнение правительствами своих международных обязательств. В этой связи хотелось бы отметить, что еще в 1994 году именно парламентская ассамблея тогда еще СБСЕ инициировала обсуждение, которое привели к принятию на Будапештском саммите кодекса поведения, касаемо касающиеся военно-политических аспектов безопасности, в котором закреплена норма о демократическом контроле над вооруженными силами, которая является элементом безопасности и стабильности. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. В Центральной Азии, регионе, система безопасности, которая неразрывно связана с глобальной системой безопасности, проблема новых вызовов стоит особенно остро. Международный терроризм, религиозный экстремизм и этнонациональный сепаратизм, организованная преступность, незаконный оборот наркотических средств и незаконный оборот оружия – Нашли благоприятную почву на территории Центральной Азии сегодня актуально. Она угрожает национальной безопасности государств, расположенных в этом регионе. В Центральном Азиатском регионе оперируют международные террористические организации или их подразделения, радикально настроенные, настроенные фундаменталисты и экстремистские лидеры, что вызывает обеспокоенность как государств региона, так и всего мирового сообщества. Территориальная близость к Афганистану также является дестабилизирующим фактором. С геополитической точки зрения регион Центральной Азии представляет собой стратегически важный регион, где пресекаются интересы многих участников международных организаций, будь то державы глобального значения, так и регионального, так и международные организации. Основная цель террористических организаций, пропаганда идей сепаратизма и регионального фундаментализма. Особенно важно то, что террористическая деятельность многих организаций тесно связана с международным наркобизнесом и незаконным оборотом оружия. В работе э, с международным терроризмом э, Республика Казахстан э, определенную лепту вносит о размещении военной базы э, впоследствии Центра транзитных перевозок в аэропорту Манас. Безусловно, за более чем за 10 лет функционирование в Казахстане Центра внес определенный вклад в укрепление безопасности в Афганистане и в регионе в целом. 
Но э, мы хотели бы э, на незаконный оборот оружия, это слабое звено в э, законодательстве, поэтому мы будем прилагать все усилия в законодательстве э, против борьбы незаконным оборотом оружия. Я думаю, что было бы неплохо, если бы мы рассмотрели еще незаконным оборотом оружия. Спасибо. With accessibility, a diplomatic approach. Dear colleague, we are uh, concerned about the current stalemate in the Treaty of Conventional Armed Forces in Europe. My country is uh, at geopolitical uh, cross, uh, crossroads in a very vola uh, volatile regions, and this one in more um, the is one of the most important reasons that compel us to attach great importance to the whole system of arms control. Therefore, I strongly believe that uh, the treaty should remain implemented until a new regime, which will have been designed upon uh, its rich experience and functioning guiding principles replace it. There is always need for a climate of transparency, mutual confidence and predictability, but this feeling of high-level security is something that only established as well tried in the course of time collaborative practice can provide. In this respect, and uh, notwithstanding its problem from 2000 Seven. Onwards, the CFE uh, uh, Treaty has been until now to a tool of inavailable Sussex. If it is to be reformed, we must opt for the functioning system that will guarantee high standing of legal binding transparency and resiliency and offering transparency, reliability, new arrangement for conventional uh, military forces. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go now to our colleague Artak Davidian from Armenia to be followed from Sevki Kulkuloglu from Turkey. Спасибо. В целях экономии времени я снимаю свое выступление. He's not here, so we go to Sevki Kulkuloglu from Turkey. Thank you, Mr. President. In light of current political military conditions, we should try to preserve and modernize the CFE regime instead of negotiating a new arrangement. It is very unlikely that any new arrangement will be as comprehensive and intrusive as the CFE regime. On the other hand, basic parameters that Turkey will seek in an updated CFE regime or a new arrangement will be the same. Legally binding nature, the three pillar system of numerical limitations, information exchange and verification, and the regional component that preserves the essence of the flank document without which the stability of the Caucasus and the Black Sea cannot be maintained. If we are to negotiate a new arrangement, we need to officially revoke the CFE treaty regime, however, Turkey will not give its consent to a new arrangement which will include certain selective elements from the CFE regime. The flank agreement is the main provider of a regional and sub-regional conventional security. It is not designed to restrict any single country. Indeed, every state subject to the flank restrictions equally benefit from it. The Turkish policy regarding the flank regime is not based on a direct threat perception from any single country, but a much wider political assessment on regional stability and security. The Vienna document 
needs updating in order to better respond to the current and emerging military challenges. Thus, we welcome the ongoing adaptation efforts within the OSCE FSC. However, this modernization process should not aim at replacing the CFE regime or some of its provisions by an updated Vienna document. The politically binding CSBMs contained the uh, Vienna document cannot be substituted for the legally binding provisions of the CFE regime, in particular the numerical limitations. Enhanced transparency and predictability cannot provide adequate security guarantees. Thank you for your attention. The last two speakers are from Italy. I start from uh, Del Vecchio. Dear colleague, you have the floor. Grazie, signor Presidente. Anche alla luce degli interventi dei relatori che hanno eh, presentato il dibattito, credo che prima di sviluppare il tema il futuro del controllo degli armamenti andrebbe chiesto, ci sarebbe da chiederci se esisterà un futuro di un controllo come noi lo vogliamo. È un interrogativo provocatorio il mio evidentemente, ma noi non possiamo sottolinea non sottolineare che il trattato CFE attualmente non è come quello originario, visto che c'è un Paese che lo ha sospeso ed altri che lo applicano soltanto parzialmente. Questa situazione deve richiamare tutti i Paesi membri dell'OSCE ad un'assunzione di responsabilità. La sicurezza europea non può prescindere dall'efficacia di un trattato delle forze convenzionali legalmente vincolante e un accordo del genere è indispensabile per prevenire potenziali conflitti nell'area di applicazione o nelle sue vicinanze. Quindi l'OSCE deve promuovere il superamento di questa situazione di stallo, cercando di mantenere separati gli aspetti politici dagli aspetti tecnici della problematica. Bisognerebbe naturalmente che le, che le politiche anche contrastanti possano confrontarsi tra di loro, ma senza infirmare quella validità di un trattato che è stato molto importante per tutti noi. Non possiamo tornare ad una situazione di rischio per la nostra regione in cui praticamente il confronto come una volta era basato sulla diffida e sull'odio tra i popoli. Grazie. Thank you. And now I go to our last speaker. I remember when I was young Claudio di Orlando Furioso, so you are the Claudio Furioso. You have the floor, my friend. D'amico, non d'Orlando, Presidente. Allora, Presidente, la ringrazio della parola, eh, ma con molta tranquillità devo dire che questo eh, ultimo dibattito eh, lo ritengo forse il più importante di questa sessione. Mi dispiace che sia finito così eh, all'ultimo punto con molte delegazioni ormai che ci hanno lasciato con i banchi in parte vuoti, perché veramente io ritengo che la nostra organizzazione, non solo dal nome, organizzazione per la sicurezza e cooperazione in Europa, ma proprio per come è nata debba tenere come prima considerazione la questione della sicurezza. E, e invece non sta avvenendo questo. Non sta avvenendo questo e anche oggi, con dispiacere, eh, ma l'ho già detto in passato, con dispiacere anche la prima pagina del sito dell'OSCE eh, governativo dice eh, come prima notizia eh, le top priorities del, dell'assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE sono eh, i diritti umani e la libertà del, di internet. Ecco, non dico che non sono questioni importanti, anzi io seguo in modo particolare la Commissione diritti umani e democrazia, però non si può dimenticare che i temi principali devono essere quelli della sicurezza, dobbiamo riportare la sicurezza come tema principale e da questa assemblea un altro argomento che è quello del secondo cesto, quello dei problemi economici, 
e dell'ambiente viene ormai considerato quasi come il terzo tema, ma in questo momento noi dovevamo uscire con i temi della sicurezza e dell'economia quando noi abbiamo problemi enormi di economia nei nostri paesi, potevamo dire, poteva essere una cosa importante, che l'OSCE, l'Assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE chiedeva a tutti gli Stati di ridurre, in un momento di crisi economica, di ridurre i budget per la difesa, per le spese delle armi, che sono quelle che servono quando si fanno le guerre, che noi dobbiamo prevenire. E quindi, invece di uscire con dei fatti forti, in un momento di crisi, in un momento nel quale lo spirito di pratica di mare mi sembra che si stia perdendo ed è un peccato, forse il tema principale doveva essere quello. Grazie. Thank you Claudio, indeed. I would like to thank on behalf of all of you, Mr. Adon Mazur, Damien Leader, Matthew Gistin, thank you for your contribution to our joint session of the three general committees. And now I go to the end. What, and by doing exactly what we did last year, the same day, the same moment. Last year, after a proposition from the Italian delegation, you gave you the permission to be a presidential statement about the Arab Spring. This morning, in the Standing Committee, the French delegation, our colleague Michel Boisin, asked to repeat the same for Syria. Uh, please, I'd like all of you to be very aware of this point. It's not a political intervention to Syria because Syria does not belong to the OEC. But there are neighbors that they are members or observers. And also there is the issue of the two journalists that they were killed in which the proposal is to pay tribute. According to our rules, i will read very carefully the proposal of the statement, the presidential statement. But if even one colleague rejects, this statement will not be delivered. I have to be clear because this is the way in which we function. This is the way in which we respect each other. So it's up to the Assembly to accept, to endorse this idea and this wording. I believe that is politically very careful way to express our concern about what happens in Syria. The proposal is this one. As President of the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, I deeply regret the violence and loss of life in Syria. As OEC, OEC participating states and partners for cooperation have expressed their concern about the current situation, I call for the full respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the country. I salute the journalists who have paid such a heavy price to keep the world informed. Is this? I think it's humanitarian, it's political, but in the sense of our hardcore values. And also it's something about the free of the press, the protection of the journalists that always concerns our assembly. Do you want me to read it again, please? Yes, I see some. So I read it again. As president of the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, i deeply regret the violence and loss of life in Syria. As OEC participating states and partners for cooperation have expressed their concern about the current situation, I call for a full respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the country. I salute the journalists who have paid such a heavy price to keep the world informed. I really believe that we have to endorse this statement and I, I don't see anybody to put any object and this is, believe me, one of the best times of our assembly that we all share that uh, what happens outside the 56 
is something that happens inside to our countries, to our hearts, to our soul, to our minds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, the interpreters, because you always suffer with us. And thank you for your contribution. Thank you all, dear colleagues. Next meeting is in Batumi. The meeting today is closed. Thank you very much.